All right, we will now call to order the April the 5th, 2022 school board meeting of the Lynchburg City School Board. And as we call our meeting uh, to order tonight, we do want to uh, ask now the board uh, the agenda, which has been before us uh, featured and appropriately reviewed prior to that is before you tonight. Is there a motion to approve our agenda for tonight's school board meeting? Made it. All right, uh, Mr. Attorney Trost made the motion seconded by Dr. Carter. Any further questions or discussion concerns concerning the agenda? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Thank you, uh, members of the board, for approving our agenda. And now we would ask all to stand as we share in the celebration of our nation through the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, I do want to inform tonight that our board tonight that our colleague, Dr. Kim Sinha, will not be here uh, due to uh, pressing assignments that needed to be done, but she has shared with me uh, some of her concerns and I will certainly bring them up at the appropriate time in which those matters come before the board tonight. Before we go into our special presentation, we are very honored always to have persons with us uh, in our school board uh, chamber, and I would like Dr. Edwards to acknowledge uh, at least a portion of them at this time. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's not often that we have some of our youngest learners mixed in a room with some of our adult learners as well, So, but I really would like to welcome um, Dr. Roger Jones and Dr. Owen Carwell and members of the University of Lynchburg who are joining us um, tonight, so we welcome you and thank you for coming uh, to our meeting, as well as all of our other guests who are here tonight, and a whole bunch of little people who we are glad that we have extra guests um, to celebrate with us tonight. So with that, I'm going to move into special presentation. That would be great. Okay, absolutely. So um, it's been a while since we've been able to take some time and have some young folks crowd our hallways in, in this building and have them join us so that we can take a moment to celebrate the accomplishments of our young people. Often we're talking about what the pandemic has done with regard to learning loss and some of the ill effects of it, but I need you all to know that our young people, in spite of the pandemic, are continuing to thrive and do some wonderful things. And they are going to share that with us tonight. So I'm going to invite to the podium Dr. Brad Bryant to talk to us a little bit about our art recognition. Uh, thank you, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Coleman, and board members. Uh, I'm honored to recognize the Virginia School Board Association Art Competition winners for 2022. Uh, first off, there were 14 entries, uh, local entries across the division, and they were judged by all of the employees in this building. And uh, the quality of the entries was outstanding. Uh, all of the entries received multiple votes, and the winners were recognized at the school level by high school, middle school, and elementary. And here are the local winners. At the high school is Kate Bentoff Lagman. You could come forward. Show up to them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. oh, wow. Excellent. Kate's art is called Delegate Do, wow. and her teacher is Ashley Merritt, and Kate is in the 11th grade at EC Glass. So oh, congratulations. Wow. congratulations. Our middle school winner is Amelia Hanks. Amelia, come forward. Um, Amelia's art is called Cubist Queen Card. Amelia's in the eighth grade, and her teacher is Karen Camden. And our elementary winner is Brianna Gates. Brianna, step forward. Yeah. 
Brianna is in the fifth grade at Perrymont, and her art is titled Northern Lights Landscape, and her teacher is Victoria Doty. All right, Brianna also placed second in the VSBA regional competition. Uh, the region consists of 12 school divisions, including Amherst, Appomattox, Bedford, Campbell, uh, uh, Danville, Lunenburg, Halifax, all of Southside Virginia. So we're really pleased that she placed second in the regional. All right. All right. So uh, congratulations to Brianna, Amelia, and Kate, and thank you for the teachers for making this, this all happen. Thank you. Yes, we, the board would love to have a picture with all of those uh, award recipients, and, yeah. and if they could just come on into the horseshoe, and mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes. let's give them another hand as we tremendous <laughs> talent in the arts. Yes. Yes, and can we? I see some principals and some teachers now. Yeah. Come on now, come on. I need my, I need my art teachers and my principals. That's exactly right. Turn around and face that way. That is beautiful. Wow. Wow. This y'all made it tough to vote. I tell you that. <laughs> give all of our administrators, teachers, a hand. Thank you for. Great work you do on a daily basis. <laughs> we'll make it work. We can, we can kind of scoop you that way. You're going to be behind. Wow. All right. <laughs> I don't know, it's a little warm back here. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. All right. Okay. Can I get your attention this way? Okay. Thank you. All right. Congratulations. Thank you all of you. Thank you very much. Dr. Brian, Apparently. you will be decorating this room with art. What's that? I said the, we have a wall face. Oh, right, right. <laughs> right. Oh, thank you, thank you. So your work will be featured in this room um, going forward. Thank you. Thank all of you for coming, and we appreciate, appreciate it. it very much. Oh, that's such a refreshing yes. uh, piece of what we're able to, to do uh, from School board member Harvey Tetros, what a wonderful, what a wonderful way to celebrate our young people and their talent. At this time, we will now move into our uh, section of our agenda, uh, section D for public comments. And uh, tonight, might I indicate that persons appearing before the school board will not be allowed to campaign for public office or promote private business ventures and should not use profanity or vulgar language or gestures make comments about a public official or an employee that are not related to their official duties, engage in behavior that disrupts the meeting or intimidates others, or addresses the school board on issues that do not concern the services, policies, role, and or responsibilities of the school board. Individual speakers shall limit their comments to three minutes. A speaker representing a group shall limit their comments to five minutes. The representative shall identify the group at the beginning of their presentation. A group may have no more than one spokesperson. The total allotted time for public comments at school board meetings is 30 minutes. Public comments are reserved for the public to provide input. The board does not respond to comments, answer questions, or otherwise engage in discussion at this time. And uh, we are delighted to have with us uh, three that have signed up uh, for in-person. Uh, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any written or... Uh, tape messages. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, the first uh, speaker for tonight is uh, Janelle uh, Smith, I believe, uh, representing the Lynchburg Area Food Council. Welcome. Do you mind if I take my mask off to speak? Okay. Thank you. I'm Janelle Smith, and I am the secretary for the Lynchburg Area Food Council. And we are coming before you tonight to introduce you to the school time, uh, the school 
Mealtime Initiative, sponsor, which is sponsored by the Lynchburg Area Food Council and aligns with the mission of the Lynchburg Area Food Council to support programs that increase healthy food access equitably. So many students rely on school lunch, school meals, and they are consistently allotted less time to consume those meals. Additionally, the seating time or the seated time for those first in line varies from those last in line. The school nutrition staff is continuing to do an amazing job incorporating more whole foods, especially fresh fruits and vegetables, into the meals. But these foods require additional time to consume. For example, if you look at eating a salad versus eating french fries, obviously there's more time that you need to chew and consume a salad. Uh, Beth Morris, who is the director of school nutrition, and her incredible staff are fully invested in this initiative and uh, have agreed to make any necessary changes to ensure this initiative's success. So previously, we've reached out to the school board um, to provide articles and research that support this 20-minute minimum in the seat time. And the benefits include in fruit, increased fruit and vegetable consumption, improved academic performance and test scores, decreased behavior issues, an elevated emotional well-being of students, and decreased in food, in, food waste, in food waste, which last year, just in school cafeterias across the country, was over a billion pounds of food waste. Additionally, according to the CDC, providing adequate time for lunch leads to increased nutritional status, which is directly tied to academic achievement, conduct, and overall school performance. Additionally, the USDA supports these claims and also finds the nutritional status is directly, directly related to the physical well-being, growth, and development, disease risk, and readiness of the student to learn. We encourage the shift from viewing lunch as simply a break in the day to the opportunity for our students to replenish their bodies with nutrients so they may bring the best versions of themselves to class, as well as a needed time for social interaction and relationship building. This week, we will begin collecting da baseline data at Bass Elementary, and we thank Ms. Hendricks, the principal at Bass, for her willingness to participate in the study and for her support. Data collection will include assessing current actual school, school lunch times for each period and grade, and determining the quantity and type of food waste. We're requesting you, the school board, to establish a policy that would allow each student a minimum of 20 minutes in the seat time to eat their lunch. The Lynchburg Area Food Council has also reached out to many stakeholders in the, in the community who support this initiative. As principals are working on schedules now for the new school year in the fall, we stress the urgency to address this policy. Please reach out to us with any additional questions you may have or um, about the information that we provided. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Smith. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker representing Rescuers of the Youth, uh, Volunteer Procedure, uh, Mr. Robert Flood. Welcome, Mr. Flood. I thank y'all again for uh, giving me the opportunity to express myself about uh, returning citizens being able to volunteer. I know we've been talking about this since 2015, and I know the COVID played a major part in it uh, to slow down things, and I know y'all that came to some decision prior to the COVID. I haven't heard anything about the outcome, and why I'm here today, because I need to know on paper what y'all came up with and what kind of qualifications that returning citizens uh, should have to be able to volunteer. I think about it, and I missed this, mentioned this before over the, uh, some time ago, when the SROs walk around the school, I think a returning citizen with a nonviolent crime would help out a lot. Because I know as well as y'all know, we need all the help we can get for unpredictable situations with our kids. And this has been going on since 2015. And we finally came up, you know, and voted, and it went the right way. Uh, that's my opinion. But I still haven't seen nothing on paper telling me the qualifications of returning citizens, how they can be able to come and volunteer at the schools. And this is 2022. 
Now, I know we talked about the COVID had us at a standstill, but COVID, hey, can't use that no more. I just need to know something, hopefully soon, at least on paper, the qualifications. When I talk to people that like to volunteer, that's returning citizens, that want to go to these schools to help these young people, because they might can recognize something that a person with a uniform on that can't. And if they're working together, I think we can, they can help out a lot. And I hope that I hear something, not the next school board meeting, but hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flood. The last speaker that I have here, according to our rules, will then be talking to us as an individual. And I hope I get this name right. Uh, Olivia um, Assonet, and you'll get me straight. But as an individual, would you like to speak before the board tonight if you're here? Oh, that was, that was a mistake. Okay, thank I'm you. Very sorry. I no, 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 but thank, thank you for, thank you for <laughs> coming. <laughs> <laughs> thank, 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 thank you for coming. All right. All right. Thank you so much. All right, at this time now, thank you for the public comments. We will now move to Section E, our student representative comments. And uh, Jade and Scott will not be with us tonight, uh, but we are able to have uh, Eugen Kim representing Her Heritage High School. And so, uh, Eugen, go right ahead. Everybody. My Hello. name is Kim, and I'm the student representative for First of all, I wanted to touch on the Lynchburg Beacon Above Hope X event, which was held on March 25th at the Academy Center of Arts. And some of our alumni, A.C. Cox, Makaya McMillan, and Sedora Booker, were able to share their thoughts on educational access to students. So a round of applause for them. A huge congratulations to Miss Alyssa Wilkinson, who is our nurse aid teacher at Heritage High School. She was chosen as a top 10 teacher for this season by the Lynchburg Living Magazine. So, once again, congratulations to Miss Wilkinson. Another huge congratulations to our Heritage High School indoor track. The girls' team was the state champs, and the boys' team was the state runner up. And we are so proud of our, all our student athletes. Congratulations to a Heritage High School alum, Frankie Hickson, who recently participated in Pro Day at Liberty University. Like I said before, we're so proud of all our students and student athletes, whether past or present. So congratulations again. Another congratulations to Mrs. Drumheller, who was selected as the recipient of Randolph University's 2022 Science Teaching Award, Ms. Drumheller teaches biology at Heritage High School, and just a huge congratulations to her. Last but not least, Pioneer Theater is putting on their production of Baskerville, and their opening night was Thursday, March 31st, and their next show is April 7th at 7 p.m. So good luck, or break a leg to our pioneers. <laughs> and that is it from me. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Eugene, for your report and for your diligence as a student rep. Uh, we appreciate you and, of course, Jaden as well. Thank you so much. We will now move to Section F, our finance report tonight, and Dr. Edwards will bring that on. Absolutely. As customary, we have our, fin our monthly finance report, and we have Ms. Manet Davis to take us through the finance report. Good evening, board. Okay, so um, you have the report in front of you. Um, the revenue we've received to date is 59.575 million or 58.13%. The expenditures to date, well, to February 28th, um, are a little over 56 million or 56.62%. And then um, our expenditures, including our encumbrances, is 92.2 million or 90.01%. Um, the year to date health insurance summary. Um, last month, February wasn't great. So we did, again, did not um, 
meet the need. So this continues our deficit grows a little more in February as well. Um, I attached the revenue and expenditure summaries. And if you've had a chance to look at it and have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Dr. Gupta. Ms. Davis, uh, our operating budget as per your statement is $102 million. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in assuming that? Yes. And what would be our approximate ADM? Is it 7,900 something, 78? I'm sorry? ADM. Um, attendance. Oh, yeah. the ADM. I actually have that. In the I, it is 7,900. Seven, we just yeah. hit it for this. 7,900. The reason I'm asking that is because last time in city councils, joint meeting, somebody said our operating budget is $150 million plus, and the cost of teaching a student is about $21,000. Based on the numbers you presented, if I do my math, it comes out to be about $12,000. That's, that's what we put in the budget book. That is our operating budget. The person, but, at whoever said the 150 was also including our grant budget, but, which is not an accurate way to portray. We'd love to have $21,000 per student for LCS, right? right? So then we give our teachers all kinds of raises. Right, before. right. We could all. So that was a way inflated number. The real number is about 12000 Correct. I just wanted that clarification. Thank you. Thank you for that significant clarification, Dr. Gupta. Any other, Dr. Brennan? Ms. Davis, I sort of continue to have some difficulty with the format that we've been getting the last couple of months. We had a previous format before, so I think Dr. Senya sort of raised this issue. But <coughs> I guess two comments on that. One is, are there any issues in here that you see as far as expen revenue and expenditures we should be aware of? And then number two, I wonder whether the Finance Committee can maybe look at this format at their upcoming meeting to decide. You know, previously we had a previous budget, current budget, actual budget, so we could kind of compare previous years to this year, and, and now we're getting the, this report, which is much more itemized, and I guess that might be in response to some request for that, but maybe we can come in some middle zone where we end up with something that is, is more helpful. But that's just a comment and directed towards the Finance Committee. But anything of, of note that you think we should be aware of in the finance report? Um, nothing that's you know, jumping out at me. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I would say that it does seem um, the available balance in the instruction seems a little high. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which one question. Look at but me. You had mentioned, and I know that we're all sort of aware of the health insurance deficit, which keeps growing. Is what is there? What is the plan for that? I know we were talking about it'll a, a be budget covered transfer. by the attrition within the the major functions that they're already there. We won't need school board to, approval to move the funds to cover those because it's sorry, already you, in the attrition. Can you say that one more time. I'm sorry. <clears throat> we'll cover it with the attrition within the each major function mm -hmm. um, for the benefits and salaries if we need to go into the salary lines as well. So will that occur at the end of the year or when will that occur? Yes. End of the year. End of okay. The year. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. The chair recognize Dr. Carter and then Ms. Morrison. I was just, this is for us that we may need to, we not may, we need to figure out as a group, nine of us, how we want this presented because, yes, because we're going to keep changing it according to who says what and how often and how loud, so. And I can give you some examples and you guys can pick from them if, mm -hmm. if you want. Ms. Morrison. So from this, we are not going to have to tap into our um, health insurance reserve. I don't believe so, now. Okay, so we will still maintain that balance and that balance is maintained at, city, at the city level, not right. at the level. Right. So from... Money's I don't. Not I used. don't foresee us having to okay. use it. Money's not used for uh, positions that we not, did not feel in benefits and other things. We will be able to cover that deficit. Mm -hmm. I believe do, so. Yes. Do we see it leveling off? No. That's what I we thought we did, and then we okay. got this past week, and we we're like, ah. But that's okay. No. Well, a lot of of the the surgeries that were postponed during COVID are now taking place, and we may be seeing some of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Uh, Attorney Trost, Mr. Trost. Uh, just a point of clarification. Uh, the deficit 
or the shortfall is going to be covered through attrition, is it coming out of the employee benefits portion of the attrition or so. the overall uh, um, employee it would probably, bucket? Probably most of it will be the benefits. Okay. In some of the functions, there's not a, probably enough in that benefits, and we'll have to go into the salary line. But it won't be outside of the major function. It'll still, if like for instance, transportation. Right. If there's um, a need in transportation, we would cover it with the transportation attrition. Do you have any feel for how much of the shortfall will be um, required to come from the salary line item? Even oh, I don't. I can get that for you I once know. we get a little closer. Ballpark 10, 20, or 50%. I mean, no idea at this point. Um, I don't know. That's a, I'd rather get I the right know. answer. I don't want to guess. Okay. I'd be wrong. Thank you. No, I'd rather not have a guess. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trost. Dr. Gupta. So just to remind, we, we are self-insured, mm -hmm. so what we pay out is what we get in premiums. Now, in the next budget, you have proposed to add about $800,000, so that will fill up some of the gap we are experiencing right now because of that increase in what we are getting. Our, our the LCS employees are lucky. The premiums are frozen. They have not gone up, although the cost of providing health care is going up. So that's the good right. thing, but the bad thing is then those deficits keep showing up. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, Superintendent Edwards has done it to add some more money to take care of this deficit next year. Uh, the question is how much will still be left over uh, next year? We're going to break even next year. I feel it. All right. Any board member that has not raised a question or concern would like to do so. Uh, I did hear Dr. Brennan's uh, thoughts. Uh, Dr. Edwards and Dr. Nillis, I don't know how you would want to handle that, but at any rate, we have heard each other's comments. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so time. much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That now moves us to our consent agenda, Section G. And a part of our consent agenda tonight is minutes from our March 2nd meeting, minutes from the March the 15th public budget hearing, minutes from the March the 15th school board work session, and the special education annual plan. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Dr. Brennan? I'd like to move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Dr. Second. Brennan. All right, Dr. Gupta will second. Oh, as Dr. The, <laughs> Dr. Gupta, we're so grateful to have you to do that. Any further questions or discussion? If not, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. School board member, Mr. Trost? Yes. School board member, Dr. Brennan? Yes. School board member Ms. Morrison? Yes. School board member Dr. Carter? Yes. School board member Dr. Coleman? Yes. School board member Dr. Nellis? Yes. School board member Dr. Gupta? Yes. School board member Mr. Harvey? Yes. Motion carries 8 to 0. Thank you very much. We're now in section H, and tonight, uh, as I call each, if you have something to report out, please do so. And if there's any uh, dates that you can tell us. We appreciate having it as well. Uh, we'll start with our Finance and Facilities Committee, uh, Dr. Nillis. Uh, the next um, meeting is April 26th. Thank you, and that's going to be a, a good meeting. So thank, thank you, Dr. Nillis. All right, our Governor's School, uh, Dr. Gupta. So our meeting is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Anybody who would like to attend, and then hopefully um, next meeting will report it. Thank you for your service, Dr. Gupta. Our Law Regional School, uh, Dr. Carter. We recently um, conducted an additional meeting April the 1st to find out the information from the final report on the efficiency study of the Law Regional Program. And it was a very detailed report with timelines and interview questions and different uh, individuals that were interviewed. They interviewed the director also the superintendents of the five area division, school divisions, and also the directors of the special education division, departments, directors for those divisions. And Dr. Asap was conducted, was contacted by Dr. Bennett, and she was then the superintendent over the Laurel School Board. And that was to, for the purpose of four things, to really look at um, to look at the declining enrollment, inclusions, uh, inclusivity or inclusion communities, the least restrictive environment and funding, and also student populations. 
and what was determined was that the law school board is really wanted and needed and it has great comments from different parents and it also is meeting the needs of a lot of students in the program and that if we expand the student needs or the students that may need it, that have IEPs but may be under emotional disturbances or that need more behavior issues, then we'll be able to increase the numbers and also due to the experts that there that are there, we'll be able to um, continue with the program. So we'll just expand the population of students served. We'll still continue to meet the needs of the medically necessary and also we'll meet the needs of the autism courses and we'll also have at least one or two new programs or classes for students that may have behavioral issues. And the, the SPED directors, they're all meeting to really, and the director of Laurel, Dr. Lewis, to iron out all the details regarding referrals, how we can make sure that every division has equal access to that Laurel program and really see what the needs are. And we're really looking at the, the need is great for students that really have some um, behavioral problems that really need that level of care and consistency and expertise of the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter, for that uh, detailed uh, report and for your service uh, with that important part of our work. All right, that will now move us to our STEM Academy, Dr. Nillis. Yeah, the STEM Academy met on March 23rd. Uh, I've got a general report of, of how things are going through with the school year. Um, things are going pretty well overall. Um, I know everybody probably knows this, but the STEM Academy is more focused on an applied emphasis for, you know, engineering technology. Um, so we got to hear about the students go through mock interviews. Uh, it's an important skill for getting into the, the in, in, into jobs, um, and uh, they had a, a good success this year with uh, companies sponsoring internships. Um, there are two in the cybersecurity, eight in it's called mechatronics, but it's you know kind of applied engineering. Um, and they also uh, they always have some in health, but they also got uh, a company. Uh, one for dentistry and a couple, um, and there's always been interest, but um, not really the support, but until this year, they have a couple um, for veterinary science, so uh, that, that's encouraging. Um, it's good to see the other companies stepping up and wow. the community getting involved. Um, well, there was a draft budget that was presented, which is pretty straightforward because they have minimal staff, but... Um, you know, that'll be voted on at the next meeting. Um, <clears throat> and I don't recall when the next meeting is, but That's okay. anyway, so, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nillis, for that information. And of course, to all our guests, all of these things are so important as they come together to help us meet the needs of our students. Uh, the Legislative Advocacy and Community Relations Committee chaired by Dr. Senna, as I mentioned, she is not able to be with us tonight but she's doing an excellent job. And the April the 12th meeting has been canceled in relationship to the break, but she will inform us and update in her fine committee on the work that they are <clears throat> striving to, to do as we go forward. All right, uh, our education task force. As you know, we had a joint meeting with council on the 22nd of March. And at this point, the matter rests with council as I presented as best I could present that this board is at a nine to zero support of the task force. Uh, there have been a couple of letters, one submitted by Dr. Nillis, one by Councilman Nelson, but at this point, the matter rests with council. And Dr. Gupta, do you have anything else to share? No, sir. All right, any questions concerning that <clears throat> board? All right, thank you very much. Uh, partners in education. Uh, there have been some wonderful meetings going on, preliminary meetings in the month of March, and I do want to thank school board member Harvey uh, for his involvement to the degree he involves himself as an individual who's been a part of that for a long time, and others to kind of get things back and moving. And so um, 
I know that there is a piece that is coming forward where the whole group is going to come together. And uh, so I don't know if Dr. Brennan wants to say anything else or if Director Reeves wants to give any specifics on that because, again, there have been preliminary meetings in the morning, various days, to kind of move this forward. Uh, Director Reeves, anything you'd like to add if, she, if she's there? Yep. Good evening. I am here. Um, we actually had a meeting last month, and I scheduled to have another one on April 7th. I That's what I'm talking about, April 7th. Right. There we go. So, yeah, those meetings were kind of preliminary meetings, and this is the full piece. And so uh, we look forward to getting that information from PI. Any board member have any statement they'd like to make regarding that? All right. Thank you so kindly. Uh, beacon of Hope, uh, Dr. Nillis or Dr. Sinha? Dr. Sinha is not here. Dr. Nillis, anything to share with Beacon no, of no Hope? No, report. All right. Uh, if I could, I'll just say that it was an exceptional uh, 10th anniversary celebration, as you heard uh, um, Eugene talk about. And so wonderful, wonderful work. All right, and the Education Foundation, uh, Mr. Trost. Yes, yes. Well, we had a wonderful meeting on March uh, 31st, and it was attended by uh, Director Jody Gillette, uh, Mac Frankfurt, Julie Doyle um, from Lynchburg Education Foundation. We primarily discussed um, ideas about how we, as a body, the school board, Education Foundation, can just give a big thank you out to the Lynchburg City School staff, the frontline employees, the teachers. Um, along those lines, Jody Gillette and her crew, including uh, Lucretia Scott and Zoe, um, put together this program. It's just family, fabulous morning of wellness. May 3rd, um, 8 to 11, and what it is, and there's been, and, and Ms. Gillette has sent out plenty of emails about it. Uh, basically, the teachers during the professional development day are able to go out and pick from amongst community activities. We've had a lot of activities been uh, donated by community members, community businesses. Lynchburg Education Foundation has paid for a significant portion of these different activities. and. At the time of our meeting, there were 500 slots available to our Lynchburg City School teachers mm -hmm. to take advantage of the different type of activities. And the list is extensive, everything from massage to going to different museums, to Frisbee golf, to painting activities, just fantastic activities to just get away and enjoy themselves. Um, as people and take a breather from this pandemic and the Lynchburg Education Foundation's way of saying thank you to the staff and the teachers has been very well received. Um, really proud, big of uh, the work that they've done. Big shout out to them uh, for getting making it happen. With that, uh, we also decided we'd have quarterly meetings. Our next meeting will be in June. We don't have a, a hard date set, but we know it's going to be in June. So, okay. great. Wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Trost. That was, a, that was great. I felt the energy from that. All of the individuals <laughs> reported, and so uh, we're excited about the work that we have before us. All right. Section uh, I, Comprehensive Strategic Plan, and of course we labored to pull this together and go 3.43 update. Uh, Dr. Edwards, lead us into that. Absolutely. So we, we have put on our agenda um, each month during our regular business me meeting an update on one of the goals and objectives, or, or sometimes more than one, for our comprehensive strategic plan. And many of you will note that once we were knee deep in the pandemic, that one of the things that we did was adjust our plan to talk about the creation of an LCS virtual academy. Um, and at the time, we definitely were doing it because it was pandemic induced. Um, but now uh, that we are sort of on the downturn of some of that, we still see that kids want to be a part of the LCS um, Academy, virtual academy um, for non-pandemic reasons. So one of the things that I've asked Josh Boyd, who is our principal, uh, to join us tonight and share with you a little bit of the journey for our virtual academy um, um, students are trailblazers, as I will call them, because they were the first class that kind of vaulted us into the virtual space 
um, in a way that we had never been there before. So I'm going to let Josh take it away. And then at the end, we can ask any questions that we may have. So thank you, Josh. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Edwards, uh, Dr. Coleman, members of the board. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I hope in the next 10 minutes I can give you an update of uh, where we are in the virtual academy, how far we've come in the past 11 months, and where we hope to go in the future. So about virtual learning, um, some people have different understandings, different beliefs about it, and so maybe some of them could be myths. So I'd like to go through uh, a game called Mythbusters and share with you maybe some myths that you may have or others may have and talk about what is true. So one myth is that virtual academy students are on their own to learn, that you're given the work and the students are expected to do it on their own. And the truth is that we have um, four ways that our teachers and our students interact on a daily basis. They have whole group synchronous and small group synchronous learning opportunities. They have one-on-one -on -one learning sessions that allow for teachers to personalize the student learning. We have personalized feedback that teachers provide to those students through uh, videos, through audio files, through annotated uh, papers. And we're trying to defeat the stigma of a one-size-fits-all program where you give them the assignment, they complete it, or they don't complete it. We're trying to meet students where they are and move them to where they need to be. And you'll see uh, some sample schedules moving forward. Another myth is that students only learn using their computers. And the truth is that Virtual Academy students um, have been and will be provided at-home learning resources. Next year, we'll be providing them kits that will be provided um, uh, with manipulatives science materials, reading texts, and school supplies to try to increase the um, equitability of our students. This year we provided some of those manipulatives and novels and foundations manipulatives, but we want to continue to do more and provide a taste of in-person learning for our virtual students. And You'll see some of the, the at-home tangible learning kit items here as well as digital resources as well. We're also going to be providing parents with, um, with parent nights, showing them how to use these materials. We know that parents sometimes don't know how to use certain materials, and so we want to be able to provide um, various times and videos for parents to be able to do that. Another myth is that virtual academy students never meet their teachers or classmates in person. The reality is that we have once a month in-person events where students meet their teachers and their classmates in meetings that are STEM-focused. They, uh, they uh, further our community partnerships. We partner right now with uh, Parks and Rec at the Miller Center, um, and we work with different community uh, agencies and different companies to try to provide some career exposure for all of our students as well. We've had a career day expo for our students to be able to see what is out there for different, for different uh, jobs and industries. We have a K-5 day during the month, and we have a 6-12 day, and we want to continue that next year and even increase it to where, especially in some of our science classes, having students come in at least twice a month for things like lab day um, or other experience, experiments as well. Another myth is that extracurricular activities are only for students who are at the base school. And the reality is, is that all of our virtual academy students may participate in these extracurricular activities at their zone school. We have students who participate in football, basketball, cheerleading, the theater, school dances. And I think that COVID, unfortunately, this year has hindered some of that participation. Um, and we, wanna, we want our students to be more dual enrolled than isolated and just virtually enrolled. So Dr. Edwards talked about this a little bit as she introduced me, but what was the Virtual Academy designed for? Many people believe that it was designed for people concerned about COVID, and once COVID left, it would, it would leave as well. But what we've learned is that families with us are here for many different reasons. They might be here because they desire a distraction-free learning environment, or maybe because they've always wanted to homeschool, but they want to use LCS teachers. Or maybe it's because they travel for sports and they want some flexibility in that school schedule. We have families that are with us because they have medical concerns, and um, the, the, the doctors have told maybe the students to stay home because of some of those medical concerns. And then we also just have students who, during COVID, 
learned at home and realized that they really learn well at home. So looking at our most recent data, so at the height of the pandemic, we had 239 students enrolled in our program. Um, during the fall, we had the Delta variant and then the Omicron variant come through our community. We also had the vaccine become available to students um, K through 12, or at least six through 12. So we had some fluctuation in our numbers. Um, currently, we have 214 students. We project about three quarters to 80% of them returning to us. Students left our program for various reasons. Maybe they moved out of the community, uh, they had access to a vaccine, or they just realized that maybe virtual learning wasn't for them for this year. For the 2022-23 enrollment period, we have 141 new applicants. 33 of those applicants are coming from outside of LCS. So maybe they used to homeschool and they're trying LCS for the first time. They might be private school families trying LCS for the first time, or they could be moving from Bedford or Campbell or Amherst County and trying LCS virtual academy because the other counties aren't offering this type of virtual academy. We actually missed our goal of 50 students since the beginning of the program, but we're getting, we're on the right track for that. Uh, virtual learning is not something that's going away. Uh, virtual Virginia, before the pandemic, had 12,000 part-time students and Currently, they have 30,000 part-time and full-time students, and they are not projecting to go below that 30,000 mm -hmm. enrollment moving forward next year. Our faculty is, is why I'm standing here today. They are a phenomenal group of people. They work hard. They work days, nights, weekends. They go to uh, students' homes to drop things off, to talk to families. They, um, they, they increase student engagement over computer screen, which is baffling to me and how they do that. Um, and we're hoping to, to gain more support and more teachers in the future to offer new courses and new electives, and we have very exciting times ahead. So how our students learn, we kind of have five pillars to our, to our program. First of all, if our students don't have a relationship with their teachers, they're not going to be able to learn. And so our teachers do a phenomenal job of building relationship through morning meetings and through homerooms and their class sessions where they try to personalize learning for their students. We have synchronous instruction, as I said before, in the whole group, small group, and one-on-one -on -one formats. So if you think back to the 2021 school year, students had asynchronous instruction and they might have met with their teacher once or twice a week or maybe four or five times a week. Now, these students are meeting with their teachers every day, multiple times a day. We obviously have asynchronous instruction where students can practice and be assessed on areas that they might need help with. And teachers know where they need to differentiate and work with students on enriching and remediating. One of the most important pillars is the personalized feedback that we're allowed or able to give our students through the Canvas program. We're able to personalize the feedback in video form, in audio form, and through annotations as well. And students are able to get a lot of feedback in these ways. This is a sample schedule of an elementary and a secondary student. One thing I'll tell you is that a school day in, a virtual, in the virtual realm looks very different from an in-person realm. When you're in person, you don't think about all the transition time that you have or all the time that students are actually working on the assignments that they're assigned. So in the virtual realm, you have to give students time to do the work you're asking them to do and to show mastery on the things you're asking them to show mastery. So you have time at the elementary schedule to provide that whole group and small group time in the morning and then allow students to have one-on-one -on -one time in the afternoon and get those assignments done. In the secondary realm, we're also trying to provide time towards the end of the day to work on those uh, pieces of coursework that they might need to do moving forward. We're also through the, um, in our secondary schedule, we're providing time built into the class to have uh, small group time for these students. So it's not just a teacher lecturing to you over a screen for 45 minutes, but the teacher might be working with you for 25 minutes and then providing 15 to 20 minutes of small group time depending on the day. What does our data tell us? Our data tells us that almost 100 students have earned our academic all-star list, which is our honor roll, A, B, or 3.0 or better. For quarter three, that's up from 90 students. In quarter number two, we have students growing. Grades four, five, and six are all on target at over eight months of growth in math, according to IXL. We have students in grades two, four, six, and eight that are all on target in, in reading at eight months of growth. 
We have students in K grades K through three that are showing growth in PALS from beginning, uh, beginning of year to mid-year. We're seeing, we're hoping to see a decrease in the number of students that are ID'd by PALS. We recently were able to hire a Title I reading teacher and we have academic tutors that are working with students who are ID'd and we're seeing growth in those students and we're hoping at the end of year to see more students um, come off that ID list. Where do we want to be? Where we want to be, technology has allowed us to do so much now. We want to be able to increase the voice and choice of our students so that they're more motivated to want to learn and own their learning. We want to be able to monitor and modify and we want to incentivize students to do well in this program. Uh, the programs that we're using, we're, allowed, we're able to pre-assess our students easier and then personalize the learning to meet their needs. And finally, we want to unlock the possibilities for all of our students through personalizing our learning. We want to challenge and support all of our students in their learning, and we want to continue to attract new families to LCS. <clears throat> our ultimate goal is to engage, educate, and empower all of our students to become college and career ready by building a positive school culture. It's very important to us. Um, and I invite each of you to come and learn more about us um, at the Virtual Academy. So now I'll open it up for questions. Wow, thank you very much for that uh, presentation, Dr. Gupta. Thank you very much. Uh, I know it's a very impressive presentation and I like your wording that virtual education is going there to stay. So what are we doing to entice homeschool students to take our, uh, is that a possibility we have explored or something we're going to explore in the future? Yeah, and actually I, I forgot to thank the community, the equity and community relations team. They did a phenomenal job of marketing this program in our community. We had a lot of families that were homeschool families, that were private school families, that maybe didn't even know about the Virtual Academy, mm -hmm. and they were able to see our program. We had some awesome videos that were made by that team. And so we were able to um, get our name out there a lot more. We had a number of homeschool families join our team this upcoming year. We had about 16 families join this past year. So we're continuing to make inroads in that homeschool population. The one, the one piece of feedback that I've received from the homeschool, from some homeschool families, is that they like the flexibility of being able to do work kind of whenever, a more of an asynchronous model, and currently our model is more synchronous, and so we're looking at how we can modify to attract some of those families. You can have a follow up. My and second question I had was, you know, you mentioned COVID and we had the technological divide because of socioeconomic reasons and we had that achievement gap. So what are you doing in virtual academy so they don't fall behind? They are ahead of the curve. Yeah, so I think part of that is pre-assessment. So knowing where they are and then tailoring the assignments and the activities to where they are and how we and get and get them to where they need to be. I think also the one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. feedback and the one-on-one -on -one time with your teacher, even though it's over a screen, is still really powerful to know where you need to go. Um, we have now that COVID is starting to kind of be in the in the, the rear view, we're looking at bringing students into our building as well in small group or in one-on-one -on -one to work on some of those skills that they might need help with as well because there are definitely needs still for, for in-person um, remediation and enrichment as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Gupta. I saw Dr. Carter's hand and then Mr. Harvey. And um, Mr. Boyd, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. My question I have is how quickly are you able to admit people, students that are on the waiting list? Yes, yeah, so the waiting list was in response to the Delta variant and the Omicron variant. What we realized is that we had no way of admitting the number of people that, needed to, that wanted to come into our program. And then shortly after that, I would say maybe two or three months after Delta started, the uh, advancement in the, in the vaccine caused a lot of those families to not be interested anymore in the program. Um, we, had, we were able to admit some of our families at the semester mark, and currently um, our high school program, a lot of the students were at the high school level. The high school program um, 
was you had to be admitted at the semester marks. So we were unable to admit those families until December. And then we, when we started to reach out to those families that were on the waiting list, many of them uh, declined because of whether they, had a, they were having a great experience at their base schools or because the, the vaccine was available for them. And so they, they did not um, wish to join us. So there's not a waiting list at this point. Uh, we had 141 families join or uh, apply for the program. And we've been talking to families who are being admitted or being accepted into the program as we speak. One more. Do uh, you have a follow-up, an yeah. additional question? Yes. Go right ahead. And how are you able to meet the needs of the students who may be taking, like, a unique course or may want a course that may, may be low, some, some difficult to access or to gain entry? Can you give me an example? Like, if they want Russian or some other <laughs> type of course. Yeah, so um, we would love to be able to offer those courses. Um, we are limited to that program of studies. So um, the one other thing that we're trying to do a little bit more now that COVID is, is in the rear view is to work with our base schools on some of those electives that students would like to take. We know that there's gonna be limitations when, you, when it comes to um, availability in the classes and teachers and things like that. We have, we're expanding our elective options um, both through some of our multi-platform mm -hmm. providers, but also with the teachers that we have on our staff. But we're also working with our base schools potentially to be able to offer some courses virtually um, with the base schools. So again, using the example of Art One um, or something like that, that we might be able to offer some of those through the base school as well. Thank you. Mr. Harvey. Okay. Uh, please, as the chair, I have two questions. Please, go right ahead. Uh, the first question, First, thank you for this information. This is this is exciting to be able to sort of get feedback on this this new endeavor that, that Lynchburg City Schools is undertaking. Uh, my question, my first question is, with the number of students who are uh, a 3.0 GPA or above, what is that percentage that are looking to return next year? Um, I, I, and I, it doesn't have to be you know, factual, exact, it's just, I just would like to know approximately how many students um, who are finding this program successful are looking at returning again. Um, and just to, in that counterpart would be how many students who might be struggling a little bit more have elected to do an alternate type program. Yeah, great question. So I'd love to be able to get back to you on the, on the actual percentage. Okay. But um, right now we are, uh, like I said, about 85% of students overall that are returning, and I would mm -hmm. say it's very high of the 96. I would say that it's probably probably closer to 95% are mm -hmm. returning. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, I, I see this as in-person learning is not better than virtual learning, and virtual learning is not better than in-person, and so we're just trying to figure out what the best fit is for all of our students. And so if a student is struggling with us, it's not necessarily because virtual learning is bad right. or in-person learning is good, it's just that it might be a better fit for mm -hmm. them. So of the students who are not in that 96 group, um, it doesn't mean that they're not working hard, it just might mean that it's just not the best fit. Right, okay. Um, my second question is, you know, as we're undergoing a facility study and so forth, you mentioned, and this is, I wanted to kind of tag on to one of the comments that you made, um, that there are in-person opportunities such as Science Lab, and you're looking to expand those opportunities a little bit more. What, what type of facilities do you use? What are, you know, since you are the virtual academy, do you find any limitations <clears throat> not having a facility type that you would like to use? You know, just just some feedback for the board. Sure, as absolutely. We would love to have board. classrooms. We'd love to be able to have classrooms where students could come in even once a week. It'd be amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Having more of a hybrid model of um, once a week the students come in for some of that hands-on piece, and then the mm -hmm. other days are, are more virtual. Um, we currently are using the Miller Center space where we had the community conversations last night. Mm -hmm. uh, we're using that space. They've been uh, gracious to loan it to us rent-free this year. Uh, we've used some other spaces as well, but we would definitely love to be able to have some classroom spaces that our teachers could share, science teachers could share this room, math teachers could share this room, and just be able to uh, put eyes on our students. You know, sometimes it's when the students are struggling and they're virtual, it's harder to get a hold of them. So being able to, to see them weekly or, or bi-weekly would be very helpful. Okay. 
And if I could just Please. follow up. And, and so with that in-person learning, how would we accomplish transportation if, especially if, if we had some students that, that might, you know, um, have working parents or something that, that how, would, how would we accomplish that? Would that be something we'd have to address with our transportation so department or? Our, our transportation department has done a phenomenal job this year of meeting our, we, we have about, of the students who attend the in-person events, which we wanna increase that next year. I know COVID has kind of hindered that. We want to, we've got about 80 to 85% of our students that parents drive them to the in-person events. Mm -hmm. So about 15 to 20% are taking the bus. But the, the transportation department does a phenomenal job of, of getting the schedules on time and the students come and it's really very seamless. So I don't see that being a problem moving Excellent. forward. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. The chair recognizes Ms. Morrison and then Dr. Brown. Thank you. I really just have two comments. The first one is, um, Thank you for recognizing that secondary students enjoy a later start time, that um, starting at eight o'clock instead of 725 would be very appealing to some members of my family. <laughs> so, good move. Second one is also, uh, I think having the opportunity for students to participate in extracurricular activities, particularly um, secondary level is really important because uh, that gives them a connection to their peers and uh, a connection to their base school. And I think that that is something that's really important and thank you for seeing that that happens and um, I'd like that to continue at, at every opportunity. We really see ourselves as a partnership with the base school and we want to continue that and grow it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morris and Dr. Brennan. Mr. Boy, I join my colleagues and thank you for the presentation and also thank you for taking on this project. You walked into this with nothing there and you've obviously built, you and your staff have built a great project, so thanks for doing that. I have three questions or comments and one is coming off of Ms. Morrison's, which is that I, I, I kind of, and I'm not an educator, so you have to with this, but as far as the concept of virtual academy, the interaction that students have with their peers, with their teachers, as part of an educational process seems to be something that is valued and is important. How does that looked upon in the, in the concept of a virtual academy? The, and I'm not saying directly with yours, but just as you look at what's happening with virtual academies, what's the philosophy of it, how do you balance having someone in, you know, separate from their peers, separate from their students, and not getting that part of their education? So I can speak to the way that when we were, de when we were designing this program, we saw kind of the effects of what virtual learning did to some students when it mm -hmm. comes to that asynchronous, that, that uh, flexible learning. It was um, very destructive in some students' mm -hmm. um, uh, education. Mm -hmm. But one thing we really wanted to build in our program was the classroom community that kids have been missing for two years. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen and what those of you who join us on Zoom calls and various things is students who want to go to these in-person events to see their friends in their classes. Mm -hmm. They, um, sometimes I open my office door and I'll hear the classes talking to each other and it just makes me happy that the synchronous, mm -hmm. um, the synchronous and the classroom communities that are being built are very rich. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. Yeah, no, that, that's great, thank you. Uh, two other things. One is, what are the demographics of your student population? Are they similar to Lynchburg City School demographics? Thank you. Yeah, I, I forgot to share that. Let me just grab that right now. Yeah, our demographics are about 51% African American, 33% Caucasian, 10% um, two or more races. Uh, we're 53% female and 47% male. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then my last comment, this may perhaps should be directed towards Dr. Erds rather than you, which is that the sustainability of your project. We know this is CARES funded sure. for I think two years and, and how to sustain it beyond that. Has there been some conversation about that or how that could happen? I, I think as we look at this, as, as we look at the landscape across our, our community, across our state, across our country, mm -hmm. um, I think COVID provided everybody with the opportunity to try something. And now that they've gotten their, their, their feet wet, mm -hmm. um, there is a percentage of people that, that finally realized, wow, this is what I was missing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that some school divisions in our area have gone away from it. And I think that we would be wise to continue with it. Mm 
-hmm. And I think as we're continuing to attract more families to our program, um, I think it would be a very wise investment. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your good work. So, so with, with regard to money, so since you brought it up, um, <laughs> it is not in our operating budget proposal, even though it's in funded completely with CARES funds. Um, we started it this year with CARES funds. It has another year of CARES funds. But CARES funds are going to e mm -hmm. expire, um, and we need to make a decision as a school board. Is this one of those things similar to you know, Gulf School, STEM Academy, and, and other things that we see that is an option for our students. Um, and, and if it is, how do we build that into the operating budget, which becomes part of the framework of what we do as Lynchburg City Schools? I will tell you, and I compliment uh, Mr. Boyd and the entire staff, because it is risky to say, we're going to take this on. And, and I had a conversation with him like, look, this is kind of seed money, research and development to see how it goes. It was very unknown because it was formed in COVID. And they have done a magnificent job of just really keeping great data, making sure that as they're moving forward, they are meeting a need, being extremely flexible because how the program was imagined in the beginning, um, they've made so many changes as they listen to their students and families as to what what um, they want and the the marriage between the the virtual academy and the base schools and just having kids have that fluidity to participate in things because they are lynchburg city school students has been wonderful so i applaud the work i will be making a recommendation in a future year not this year because it's cares funded that we do um, consider funding this program as a viable option for students um, k-12 uh, through our operating budget going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes Dr. Gupta and then Mr. Trost. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I got two questions. Do you support Fort Hill students? Fort Hill this year, Fort Hill has had kind of a virtual option. Um, we would definitely, we, we have students that have come from the Empowerment Academy over to us. So we would definitely, if that's the best fit for a Fort Hill student, we would definitely look at that. Um, as being a good option. But that has not been done yet. Currently this year we have not, we have not um, had a Fort Hill student join us yet, no. But they do run a virtual program. I believe they had a, a small virtual program for some of their students. And the second question was, just out of curiosity, how do you run labs in a STEM program, like organic chemistry? If I'm taking the course, how would I do a virtual lab? But an anatomy is possible, <laughs> but organic chemistry. I, I would, if, if my science teacher was up here with you, she'd probably tell you very boringly. Um, <laughs> showing, showing students how it is, um, you know, many of our families have the ability to have some of those resources in their homes to be able to do some of those experiments. But I think the at-home learning kits are going to kind of level the playing field to be able to do some of those things together virtually. But then again, having that lab time together uh, whether it's it's once a month, twice a month, will hopefully hit at some of the things you're you're getting at. So that's what I was getting to. Do you provide in-home kits for students whose families cannot afford? We will be we will be providing it for all families next year. And and we provided everybody who received resources this year. Everybody received them. So it wasn't just certain families; it was everybody. But we want to be able to expand it to be more resources as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Gutam, Mr. Trost. Uh, kudos to you and the program. I'm even more impressed that you put it together. At, it's an outstanding program. Um, sounds like it anyway. My question for you is, absent the startup cost, taking out that, and the fact sounds like we didn't have the full science kit like you'd like to, sure. do we have an idea of what the going forward cost is going to be per student? Or maybe for the program, because it looks like this sure. is flexible in terms of students. That's a great question. I don't have that answer, but I can definitely brainstorm that idea with, and share it with you later. Thank you. So startup cost for? Uh, well, per really the cost, cost per student. Okay. And really, I guess going forward, because it sounds like you may have had some growing pains or seed money, and there's always upstart cost. And it sounds like you are doing some uh, flexible program. Mm -hmm. Maybe next coming year, you're going to have more of a, uh, you know what you're going to do. Yep. Case in point being the, uh, the science kits are going home, which sounds like you didn't really have those last year. I could definitely get that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trost. If everyone has had an opportunity to share on this. I would like my colleagues to join in giving him another applause.
cutting edge piece, and we appreciate you and all of the staff. All right, now we're going to move into Jay, as it pleases the board. We'll keep moving here uh, in our unfinished business and the LCS community update section, Dr. Edwards. Absolutely. Uh, we do have a few updates under this section. Uh, you may recall the beginning of this year, uh, 2022. I think every minute, every meeting, we were talking about the LCS school budget, and it's been a little quiet on our end, although actively busy behind the scenes. So I just wanted to update our community on where we are um, with our LCS budget, budget proposal, where they can find information regarding our LCS budget. Um, there are documents uh, when the board uh, adopted its budget on March 15th. If you go to our, our board docs, you will see some documents uh, in both the budget hearing and the budget work session that outline the priorities that the school board has discussed with regard to the budget. Um, on March 14th, or 15th, sorry, the administration did present the school board with some priorities that were labeled priority zero, which are things that are just going to increase whether we like it or not. Some of that is tuition, dual enrollment fees, we also, as Dr. Gupta mentioned, increased health insurance by 10%. That's 800,000, a little bit over $800,000. That's following the 7% that we increased last year. And part of that is not pushing costs off to the employees. So as the employers, we are absorbing that cost. Um, some liability insurance going up. And it's uh, no mystery that fuel costs we were projecting that they were going up and boy did they go up rather quickly in the current year. Um, so you will see some priority zeros, which means you know, no matter what we do, we're going to see some increases just from existing in those items and they are going to go up. Uh, the next level, and Dr. Gupta helped me appreciate uh, changing the nomenclature here. So while salary increases um, are at the option of the school board, and I know that the school board does not feel like those are optional, no, we label those one plus in our priority list. And the, the proposal that the administration had brought to the school board was for the 5% um, salary increase. And the school board actually voted for an 8% salary increase. But I do wanna just back up a little bit and remind um, this school board Per the governor's original budget in December, and even looking at the two budgets from House and Senate, it is a 5% increase this year, or a four and a bonus, and another percent increase next year. Well, no, we're not talking about next year, but it's another 5% next year, which is really, if we look at budgeting um, since you know I've been here, we've seen an increase like 5% over the biennium, which has been over a two-year period. So we could do part of it, maybe 2% this year and a 3% the next year, and make up the difference. If we use the biennium language, it's 10.25%. 5% and then 5% compounded on this year is 10.25% over the biennium. So it is a bigger increase requiring a different kind of level of support that LCS just doesn't have internally, which is why you may see us requesting um, support from city council. So once again, the documents on board docs represent the 5% increase, even though the board voted for an 8% increase with some adjustments to bring our staff up to the current living wage per MIT right now, which is about 1403 an hour. That changes every year. When we first started this work, it was $11.11. .11. It is now 1403, and we have over 200 employees that don't make that in the current year. So the 8% increase served to sort of begin to address that, and I say begin to address that because that, that goes up and so shall um, the salaries. Lastly, I said priority zero, one plus being the salaries, and then there are some things that are priority one, and some of those things are um, instructional staff. Uh, some of them are courses and access like the CTE Academy and courses at the University of Lynchburg for our students. Some of them um, are actually partly funded by state funds with the pre-K three, pre-K four, early childhood initiatives, school counselors, 
Um, and we also talked about some support for our library um, media specialists, as well as um, some additional supervisors, uh, partners in ed liaison, and then um, just some small, but we appreciate you employee perks in terms of some of the things that we added with sick leave payout, uh, increasing bereavement days, paying for the recertification fees, things like that. So if anybody in our community is interested in what is LCS actually asking for in their budget, you can get those documents right off of our board docs from March um, 15th. And again, those represent the, um, the uh, 5% increase, even though the board voted for a, an 8% increase. And then I'd just like to address this, the $50 million question. And Dr. Gucci, you alluded to a little bit when Ms. Davis was up there and she was talking about our operating budget being about a $100 million operating budget, um, which is our normal uh, budget. Um, but then there's $50 million that is in grant funding. Um, and you all know some grant funding, one, is not always guaranteed, but I want to just dig into that a little bit so that our community has a better understanding. First fact, where do I find information about this $50 million? Where is it listed? On March 15th, we actually presented all of the documents. There is a document in there that has tabs. The last tab shows $50 million worth of grant information. Um, and I happen to have that in front of me. So I'm just gonna pick apart some of this because our community may not understand things when it says federal grants programs for set aside, $892,000. That is money that comes to LCS that we actually hold and distribute to not LCS. We set aside for uh, delinquent, private schools, uh, other institutions, it, that's why it's called a set aside. It is not money that LCS can just use to do anything that we want uh, with. Of, of also of interest on here are some Commonwealth of Virginia grants and programs, fiscal agent funds. We are the fiscal agent, which means we hold, monitor, and distribute money for other people. We don't get to keep it the same way. The bank does not get to keep your money. They're kind of holding it for you, although they do try to take some of it from time to time. There's a million dollars that's sitting there for the Blue Ridge Regional Jail, which we're the fiscal agent for, the detention and home, um, detention home and child development clinic. That again is not money that someone can say, there's a million dollars, why don't you use that to assist with salaries? We cannot do that. Also included in this, we had a wonderful um, report, and we are extremely grateful to our grant partners like the Ed Foundation. And in addition to funding our morning of wellness, which is very well needed and very well received, the Ed Foundation throughout the year gives our teachers and our staffs grants. Our teachers write these grants. They put it together, they come up with a great idea. Sometimes they do it with their students. There's about $80,000 that we projected that the Ed Foundation will give our teachers and staff in grants written by teachers and staff for programs in their classrooms. Not money that I could just take and say, I'm gonna use that to do um, whatever I would like to do with it. Um, there are some other things in here. There is a big $3.5 million school construction grant. Now, I think that I would probably get in some kind of trouble if I decided to use that money for salaries and benefits. I just want our community to really take a closer look when someone says there's $50 million. Why isn't that enough to meet the needs for what LCS needs? This money often comes with some kinds of guidance, restrictions. Also in this $50 million is all of the CARES money. And most of us have been using CARES money as one-time funds because in a couple years, this money will not be there. And I certainly don't wanna build anybody's salary off of this, although you did hear me say, the virtual school is currently funded by CARES and that's something that this board needs to consider. It's not a practice that you wanna do with your entire division and put all of your staff in there. Our Title I money for our at-risk students, our Title II money for teacher, teacher quality, our Title III money for our ELL, our Title IV money for student support is also in, in this 
50 million dollars as well as money outlined for Perkins grant and all of those who are familiar with Perkins knows that's our CTE that's our career and technical education money to support that and our homeless grant as well there's money in here to support homeless students so please when you hear the 50 million dollars please take a look at what exactly is in that 50 million dollars it's grant funded um, look for yourself we will be happy to answer any questions regarding any of that information we've been sharing that information um, with our, our 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 partners across the street as we enter the budget conversations so what's going on right now it's been pretty quiet here at lcs um, right now we are receiving questions from our mm -hmm. council members questions from our city manager um, and they are meeting primarily on tuesdays and thursdays um, to to talk about the budget and to the best of our ability we are giving them answers to the questions that they have asked us i'm also sharing those with school board members just so that you stay abreast but the community may not know that so i wanted to take a pause and let the community know um, what we are doing the budget is not final until uh, council takes action on what um, the allocation to the schools will be and then the board will come back and take final action on that as well um, but I did want to just point out that this school board is extremely um, committed and dedicated and has done a lot of hard work. Uh, one of the things that they started in 2000, the fall of 2018, our salary scales have been frozen for nine years. The fall of 2018, this board got together and did some hard work, and I think we met monthly. Um, and review pay tables and we reinstated those we were successful for the first year then COVID hit but even in COVID we managed to give a bonus then we turned around we waited looked at sales tax we went, went up a step mid-year gave another bonus and ended up with a three percent cost of living adjustment we've done all of that in the last four years without receiving any increase from city council we've done that with level funding and with a cut of $2.2 million in, a, in one year and $1.5 million in another year. Um, we've tightened our belt and we're doing due diligence as we move forward and we wanna continue to do that, but it is a community um, support. As far as our salary guides go, we did do some drafts. Um, that was the first thing that we started with, differentiated salary guides. And we wanted to make the point, and actually one of our goals was just to make sure that our employees who were on the lower wage scale, our hourly employees who as low as $11.67 an hour, when we added whether it was the 5% or the 8%, but even at the 5%, we wanted those employees to see higher percentage increases. Um, so we went through of all of our pay tables, we mapped them all out, we presented them to the board, and we said, if you are on this salary scale on our classified, there were 24 of those for classified. We kind of shrunk them into eight to make more sense. This is where you would be. This is where we're going to move you. And this is the percent increase that you would see. So there have been lots of questions about where's the money going? We've been very transparent with the school board to say, well, if you know, I have my book here, so I'm just gonna open up to one and just pick one out well if you are on the classified scale of d plus and you were making 11.67 an hour the projected increase this is the five percent um, would have been 14.57 percent for you to move you up from 11.67 to 13.37 that was the kind of work that this administration did and brought to the staff uh, brought to the school board in addition to looking at the folks on the other end, and while their percentages might have been lower, not 12, 14, 13, um, the dollar amount as a lower percentage on a higher wage was still appropriate. So again, that work has been done. We did it for 5%, we scaled it up for 8%, and we continue to work uh, with that. But I felt like I needed to give our community an update on um, where we are in our budget process as we um, sort of wait as council debates the entire budget of the city, of which Lynchburg City Schools is a component of that. And I wanted to give Ms. Davis, did I miss anything? Um, the only other thing that I could think of is um, just I want to make sure that the information 
that's out there um, is accurate. And one of the things that I've, I'm seeing on social media is um, that we're cutting our special education funding mm. or our special education programs. Well, one, we, we couldn't do that. Right. <laughs> um, but two, this state funding has been cut, and it's been cut for every school division in Virginia. Um, but there are um, other, with the hold harmless, the rebenchmarking makes us whole on that. So we're not cutting mm -hmm. our special education funding at all. We're not looking to. We have to spend at least what we spent this year. So I just wanted to clarify that, you know, um, we don't make the decisions about revenues. We're not making any cuts in our revenue. We don't make those decisions and that we are going to keep our special education whole. And with regard to mm -hmm. the career and technical education, because when we first presented the budget, it looked like right. we had a $400,000 cut in career and technical education. And I know community members reached out and we reached out and figured out that there was an error made in how we accounted for the minutes um, for CTE during the year that we were hybrid. We reached out to DOE, they were great in working with us and we have completely corrected that error. So the budget documents that are on March 15th, uh, board, work, uh, board docs actually have the corrected amount, which is over $500,000, I think it's something like that, um, for for the final funds for um, voc vocational education. Mm -hmm. So that has also been reinstated. We know that that was a concern um, that was raised as well. <coughs> and I think that is it for us in our quick update on the budget proposal. Th thank you, um, Madam Superintendent. And I do want to commend each board member for your commitment to the will of the board to advocate for 8% and to do everything you can with members of council and others in the community. So I want to thank each of you for your efforts, uh, our various uh, groups and so forth. Thank you for your participation and engagement. We'll keep fighting on. Unless there's something pertinent that needs to be said at this time, uh, we will allow that uh, to rest at that matter and we'll now move on to the facilities study piece. Absolutely, so following up our joint meeting on uh, March 22nd that we had with uh, city and schools where uh, Dominion 7, Blair Smith from Dominion 7 came and gave an overview of our facility study, which is primarily focused on our elementary facilities. Uh, he talked about the different parts of the study, one being a facilities con uh, condition assessment where he looks at the, the age of the buildings, um, the systems, HVAC, plumbing, and so on and so forth. Um, he also is combining that with some, he did some preliminary uh, demographics in terms of the number of students, number of classrooms in the building, combining that with what are our now day requirements. And I think at that point we talked about, at least for K-3 having class size reduction where the state determines what, what our class sizes should be for K-3. So we do have some grade levels in some schools where the maximum class size is 19 even though most folks think about a class as being 25. If we want to continue to accept those funds, which are over a million dollars, um, we have to follow that, that class size. Part two will be coming up soon after we come back from um, spring break on April 19th at our work session. Um, Blair will be back with the final demographic information um, and some recommendations along with that, combining that with the facilities study. Um, and we're having those tough conversations. They start with the best news of all, I like to say, new construction, because that's how we started this whole conversation when I, when I first became superintendent. Here on the books was a replacement for Sandusky Elementary School, a new, a new school that's always new and exciting, but it also comes with some other challenges, especially if you're building a new school that holds twice as many students as the old school. Um, then you start looking at some consolidation, possibly some rezoning and some closures as well. So on April 19th, we will have the final presentation from D Dominion 7. Then we're taking the show out on the road and we do need community. So on the next couple Mondays, April 25th, we will be at Sandusky Elementary School um, at six o'clock and we're inviting anyone to attend, but specifically staff and family members and students and community members in the Sandusky area, the Sheffield Elementary School area, the Perrymont Elementary School area, and Heritage. 
area. So that, that meeting at Sandusky, we're hoping to get and make that more convenient for families who live up and around that area. That is on April 25th. We will share fact information from the facility study and engage our community, our family, and our staff in some of their thoughts and ideas revolving new construction, school consolidation, rezoning, and possible school closures. May 2nd, we will be at Linkhorn Elementary for the Linkhorn Elementary family staff, the T.C. Miller Elementary family and staff, and the Darrington Elementary family and staff. Again, anyone can come to any of these, um, but we're just trying to make it convenient for folks to travel to a school closer to their neighborhood. Um, May 9th is Paul Monroe, 6 p.m., and that's for the Paul Monroe and Bedford Hills family and staff area. And then May 16th is R.S. Payne um, at 6 p.m., and that, again, is for folks who attend or work at R.S. Payne, Bass, and we're including Hutcherson Early Learning Center in this area as well. And then on May 23rd, we'll have a fifth one at a location to be determined to kind of wrap it up and also offer one more opportunity for our community residents to meet us and give us um, input and information. Um, we specifically chose those host schools. Um, if you remember anything about uh, the diagram in our capital improvement plan, you will know that Sandusky Elementary School is the school which prompted the, do we need to build a new school? That school may need to be replaced. Um, Linkhorn Elementary School, Paul Monroe and R.S. Payne are the next three schools in line for renovations. So we are not only just talking about new construction and possible consolidation, but we're also looking at what do we need in our buildings upkeep for the next upcoming year. So we are hosting them at buildings so that community members who may not have ever been in those schools, now's an opportunity for you to come inside of, the, of those schools as well. So we do wanna invite community um, to join us. We will have a small group presentation and we will have table talk where um, we all give opportunity so that we can maximize the voice in the room. And we've done this before where each table will have you know, wall charts and things like that. And that way we don't have a meeting where only four or five people had an opportunity to speak. We really want to hear from our staff, our residents, our families um, around that and around um, those particular areas. So, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Edwards. I know all of us will look forward to getting to each of those and promoting it and uh, figuring out how we would be involved in that process as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Edwards, and uh, student support. Okay, two more um, student support practices, and I'm actually not gonna be the one talking about this, um, but we have done a couple community conversations, uh, two in the last, last two Mondays with uh, Kat Phillips um, and Rich, Richard Ferguson, who are two of our fantastic staff members who've been working with our families on ways that we can better support our students. Tonight, I have uh, Director Brown, I see her up there, who is gonna talk to us a little bit more about student support practices. So I'm gonna turn it over to Director Brown. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Um, as Dr. Edwards said um, and stated, for the last two weeks, um, we've had our support staff out um, talking to the community members um, and parents and also staff in regards to springtime and safety. I say all this because um, at the end of the day, we're talking about the safety of our students. That being said, um, we've had um, this month has um, we've been dealing a lot with bullying. And on that topic, I'd like to ask um, and just pose a question. Um, is it rude? Is it mean? Or is it bullying? And if it is bullying, what type of bullying is it? As a community and school division, we all must learn to distinguish between rude, mean, and bullying behaviors. Rude behaviors is when a person unintentionally says or does something that hurts someone else's feelings. Mean behaviors when a person purposefully says or does something to hurt someone maybe once or twice. The difference between a rude behavior and a mean behavior has to do with intention. While rudeness is often unintentional, mean behaviors tend to hurt or make a person feel less than. 
Bullying behaviors is when a person is intentionally aggressive towards someone else. This behavior is repeated over time and involves an imbalance of power. Thus, there is an intent to harm, a power imbalance, and repeated acts of threats or aggressions over a period of time. Bullying can take the form of physical, verbal, relational, excuse me, relational, or carried out through technology such as cyberbullying. This may take place in the form of social media like Snapchat, Instagram, or video games that involve group chats. In regards to bullying awareness, interventions, and preventions, our school social workers, counselors, and secondary interventionists are resources for our students and families who offer small group instruction related to this topic. In addition, LCS utilizes instructional, instructional curriculum, such as Second Steps for elementary students and YTRI for secondary students in regards to prevention and intervention measures. Um, teachers are also trained in bullying awareness um, annually. In addition, LCS has begun to implement staff training for youth and mental health first aid to address the social emotional needs of students who are the bullet and who are the victim. We will continue to monitor reports of bullying, harassment, and intimidation through our designated student services supervisor in the division education analysis. Um, we have began looking at five, a five-year trend, um, and we are currently analyzing that data to report out um, later on in June or July to the school board. Students and parents um, and guardians are always encouraged to report any allegation of bullying, harassment, or intimidation directly to a school staff member. But they can also report anonymously mm -hmm. through Speak Up. And Speak Up is a service that we use um, in which someone can report through our safety tip line. Um, and it's anyone can report 24 hours a day seven days a week to this tip line. That call goes directly to our service provider, Gaggle, and then they will prompt a response um, to the Office of Student Services for us to follow up um, with any type of allegation or inappropriate activity or action that might have occurred. Lastly, I would like to ask the community and our students if you see something, say something, and do not be a bystander. Um, LCS takes bullying, harassment, and intimidation very seriously, and we just want the community to know that we are looking into every single um, bullying, intimidation, or harassment um, allegation, um, and we will follow up on every single report of it. But in order to do that, we need the community, we need the students, we need parents and guardians to stand up and say something. Um, and to also let the adults know so we can stop it right away. So this bullying could stop within our schools and we hope that it also goes out into the community and begin to stop within the community as well and also on social media. Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Director Brown. All right, thank you. That, that was um, a very concise and certainly as all things get ready, we look at all of these distinguished gentlemen out here and gentle ladies and that you can help us. Go ahead, Dr. Edwards. Okay, the last thing on our LCS um, update is our LCS career fair. And I happen to have some snacks here, which says, where can you work where it's 100% amazing, respectful, strong, you have friends, courageous, love, hardworking, trust, dedication, laughter, and caring. Get a job at our LCS Career Fair, which is, this is just one of the cute little things that we had um, at our Career Fair. And what I'd like to do is invite our um, Director Scott to kind of give you a quick overview of the past one and things to come, and I'll pass this down. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. I'm excited to give you an update regarding the Education Career Fair that took place on March the 26th at Heritage High School. 
This was an exciting opportunity for us to recruit and hire instructional, non-instructional, and substitute staff. The career fair was a collaboration of our, um, of our schools and departments across our division. We had staff from the majority of our schools and departments that participated and were there to share their open positions, discuss their culture in the building, and student population. We were proactive with marketing and advertisement um, on social media, radio, and television. Attendees um, that pre-registered, which is non-LCS employees, for the event had several chances to, rent, to win free gas money. Um, we gave away some gift cards. This was a way to encourage um, attendees to attend the event. Also, we provided some LCS swag that Dr. Edwards just mentioned. Um, we had 76 attendees pre-registered for the event. Out of that number, we had 53 attended the event. Interviews were conducted during this event, and we were ready and available um, to make contingent offers of employment. Overall, it was a great opportunity for our attendees to see the positions we have open and to meet our staff face-to-face. -face. We are hosting our next education career fair at Heritage High School on Saturday, April the 30th at 9 o'clock to noon. Thank you, thank you. And for those community members looking to join the LCS team, Director Scott is your person. Please go on our website. You can see all of our current available positions and we will definitely be posting for next year as well as they come online. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Edwards, for those updates. Uh, if the board would be okay with it, uh, the uh, J-2 is a policy discussion, and we do have our school board attorney with us tonight. If we could maybe just take a three or four minute break, and then you can refresh yourselves, and, and uh, we'll come right back and handle this action item that is before us, JT, on public participation at school board meetings. We will recess for five minutes.
That's, that's my wannabe, my wannabe brother. leading a grassroots leadership development project through Lynchburg tomorrow. And the individuals that are here tonight meet at Diamond Hill Church two days a month, I believe. And they are here to observe how governmental bodies such as ours seek to do the work that we are tasked to do. And so again, thank you for your attendance tonight. As uh, we move forward, I do want to um, digress for just a moment. I did not know that Dr. Gupta had a question regarding the facilities piece, and if you'd like to raise your question, you can. I, thank you. I just wanted to reinforce the point I said in the joint meeting with the city council. As I look at this facility study, and I'm basically I'm driving down Campbell Avenue to Camper Street, mm -hmm. uh, down on Ford Avenue into Oakley Avenue. Mm -hmm. So we got to keep that in mind. <clears throat> All these parents are working eight to 16 hours a day to put food on their table, they may cannot and may not be able to do a squeaky wheel gig at our community events. So uh, we got to be mindful of that. And they all basically somehow skewed into War II, District Two schools. So also mindful of the fact. So I just don't want those uh, kids to be left behind uh, just because their parents are you know trying to earn a living and not being able to show up in those community conversations thank you dr gupta and i neglected to say that we'll have other forms of which people can communicate with us including getting input from staff that serve those very families um, who work with them as well is there any way we can work with the local churches like yeah, diamond hill baptist church and dr coleman is in uh, in the very same thing mm -hmm. yeah we're, we're all willing to serve. This is an eager group to serve. I see uh, nodded heads back in the back. So, Dr. Edwards, all of that will be at your disposal okay. to do whatever needs to be done. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. All right, if we now will move to J2, I want us all to take a deep breath because we're going to talk this out, nothing rushing. But this is coming before us by action tonight, and it is pertaining to policy B, DDHZ, public participation at school board meetings. So I'm going to ask Dr. Edwards to kind of um, get this queued up for us in terms of the process, and then we'll have a conversation about it in relationship to what you see and other board members who may have other thoughts to add or ha however, and our school board attorney is available if in fact we need, need some assistance. Dr. Edwards. Yep, absolutely. So the, the policy that is online mm -hmm. is color coded um, and anything that you see in red that is being recommended for um, strike is in our existing policy and in green is either new or moved and shifted um, from its original location. Um, so our policy for public participation, we never changed the actual policy when we went into a state of emergency um, with COVID. And actually, way, way back when we had a state of emergency, one of the flexibilities was that we can respond in real time to adjust any policies with regard to the state of emergency. And that would have been in 2020 when we first, um, the governor first closed schools and then into the start of the school year. But as a result of trying to follow CDC guidance for K-12 schools and just being pra practicing um, good uh, social distancing and mitigation strategies, uh, we as a board, uh, as we continue to serve all through the COVID, not missing a meeting, I don't, I don't think we missed a single meeting, um, decided that we would provide public additional opportunities to engage that went beyond just signing up to speak at the podium. <clears throat> 
One of those opportunities was to send something written that was specifically given to the clerk that said, could you please read this out of school board? Because we recognize lots of folks weren't coming out uh, to meetings due to COVID. Um, the second was leaving a voice message on the school board or school clerk's phone uh, line, and then we would play that up. So what this green section, this first green section attempts to do is to include in the policy what we have actually been practicing that was the result of the first state of emergency when we had COVID. You all have been gracious to continue to practice that even up to tonight, you still continue to say, are there any voice messages? Or are there anything to be read? It's just not part of our policy. So we added it in there as an official part of a policy. It is on board docs as a practice, but wasn't a part of our policy. Um, the other thing that you'll see is the pronoun changes. Each time we have policy, we adjust um, pronouns accordingly. Um, and then you will see in the bottom where it says persons desiring to address, that's in red. We just moved that paragraph up so it was better connected to the practice. So there was really no change in the paragraph except for moving it up. And then I do wanna call your attention to the very last paragraph where it says, upon recognition for the chair, the speaker should clearly state name, address and the subject of the speaker's remark and of course we um, had a conversation about whether or not people should state their address our policy actually does say that they should state their address um, and then we also have practices around individual speakers and um, speakers for the group uh, so those are the changes that we have put in place for your discussion tonight Thank you, Dr. Edwards. The first thing I want to establish is that with these governance review groups, working groups, board members are not on any of those groups. So the team that looked at this uh, had a good eye based upon what they had been hearing from us to some degree, et cetera. So this is something that that particular group looked at and no individual board member as such as what you have before you at this time. Uh, I do want to ask, um, Attorney Towns, are you there? Yes, I am. Listen, this is, this is just a real simple question that I'm just asking in, in, uh, for the public. In terms of a local school board, to what degree are we required to have public comments? Are we required to have it? Do we not have to have it? I'm just asking that, not for any purpose, I'm just wanting the public to know any information you may or may not have on that. The school board is not required to have public comments um, as compared to the city or county local government. All right, so however, go ahead. I'm however, sorry, please. I'm sorry. So however, you do have uh, public comments. Um, um, you know, you're allowed to set rules and regulations in place as to topic, manner, and time. Thank you. Thank you, attorney. So with that in mind, I think the will of this board across the, the decades has been at least to embrace our public. We want public engagement. So now what we're trying to do, since we have this opportunity, is to bring our policy up to speed. What you see in green it have been the practices as a result of COVID. There may be some additional statements. I do want to acknowledge that Dr. Sinha is not here tonight, but that she did want me to inform us that she embraces continuing uh, what we were doing during COVID and that she further embraces Mr. Harvey's recommendations. I just wanted to put that out before I forget it, but that's one board member wanting to articulate their concerns. So now the floor is open relative to <clears throat> this policy. And I think the best thing to do is if we could just go around the room with Attorney Troll starting with you and each person can share their comments, additional things you may or may not want to add, et cetera, and then we'll see what we've got. All right, Mr. Trolls? Yeah, um, I too uh, agree with uh, Mr. Harvey, Board Director, Member Harvey, in terms of his recommendations or at least his thoughts uh, and those thoughts, and he can uh, step in if I, I chew him up or get them wrong, but they really were geared at trying to get our stakeholders' priority 
in addressing the school board. And that's, I think, I share that, uh, that sentiment. Um, and what that means is, you know, let's let the parents, the students um, of our school children have priority in addressing us. Um, certainly, I want to hear what these other, what other groups have to say, especially if they're groups based in Lynchburg. Um, that's very important. But I really, because we're limited in time, I really think the priority has to be there for our local stakeholders, which in my mind are the uh, parents of students and students. And I'm not sure necessarily the order, but that's kind of where I fall on that, on that realm. Thank you, Mr. Tros. Dr. Brennan. So I'd just like to reiterate what Dr. Coleman said, that I think this board has always wanted to encourage public comments, and we want to continue to do that. And I think it's a very valuable part of our process that we do on a monthly basis, and I'm certainly strongly in favor of that also. Um, I, I have two comments I'd like to, to add to the discussion. Sure. One is that, um, I'm not sure exactly how to do this, but on paragraph so we have the, the green, we have the, the information in green. The, yes. the second paragraph below that that begins, individual speakers shall limit their comments. Mm -hmm. In there, we say that the time, the total allotted time for public comments to school board meetings is 30 minutes. I'd like the board to consider whether we want to add a phrase that says the entire, the entire public comment period should not exceed 30 minutes unless the majority of the board agree to extending the time to allow additional comments that it's in writing that if we want to prolong it because there are people we still want to hear from, we have the opportunity to do that. And I think it's somewhere buried in some other policy someplace, but if we're going to look at this policy, I'd like that to be, be part of the policy. And the other one is that, and, I've, and uh, those who have been on the board longer than I maybe understand this, but this, the other paragraph I have is the first one that's in green um, below the, the, the bullet points, which says, Persons desiring to address the school board should submit an advance request in writing to the school board clerk no later than 12 noon of the Wednesday preceding the regular board meeting or by signing the public comment form, which should be available. And I think the city council does this and maybe it's carried over from that. But since I've been on the board that I never understood why we have that process. And particularly if we're expanding now into voicemails and other meads, should it say something like, Persons desiring to address the school board by a written statement or voicemail message, that's an addition, shall submit the written statement or voicemail to the school board clerk no later than sometime, for example, 4 p.m. on the day of the board meeting, uh, or by signing the public comment form, which shall be available 15 minutes before the meeting. So I'm wondering whether we don't want to get rid of this time, which is a week before, that I don't think anyone's ever adhered to, and say for all comments, and I, I would turn to our, our, our clerk of the court to help me with this, so it's not coming in at 4.55 and someone gets upset because they didn't get you know, a message read, but there's some time period there, whether it's 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock, several two hours before, some term that we say there's a cutoff for voicemails and emails. It's 3.30. 3.30? Excuse me, what did you say? I think the cutoff time is 3.30. Uh, okay. it's in the, I think it's in the rag somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, those are the two comments that I'd like to put out. And, and regarding Mr. Harvey's uh, suggestions, I like the idea that students of LCS should be permitted to speak first. Parents of students shall be permitted next. General public should be last. And I also like the idea that each speaker should identify the district or address where they reside um, in the state, which I guess we already have on the, in the policy. Thank you. All right. For the, for the record, once we get to the end of this, uh, some of you are giving very clear thoughts, but there's language associated with it. And of course, the workmanship of all this, wordsmanship of all of this, persons like Dr. Nillis and Dr. Uh, Edwards, they can get all that real fast together for us, because obviously we can't vote on something unless we're clear on the language. But so far, I've heard two very clear thoughts. Uh, Ms. Morrison. I, I I do like the idea of students and parents, um, but I also really like the idea of our public um, being able to make sure that we have time to hear from public on their on, on topics of interest. I find that very helpful, and I think that those should come before any written message is read or any telephone message, because if, if there are public comments to the board, 
we do get those messages. We do get those copies of the telephone messages and the um, written messages. So I, I would like the priority to be on, on those uh, the individuals that are here in person. Uh, and I also really like the opportunity to extend the time, particularly if it is a topic of discussion for the board at the meeting. If we are discussing facilities or, or um, a budget item and there are individuals here and we're already discussing it on our agenda item, I think that should be a consideration for uh, extending the time. I know that they do that in other school divisions and I've liked when I've watched what they do with that information uh, if it's topic specific. I do have a question about who we uh, reviewing the, tech, the written messages and the telephone messages and the appropriateness of, of the content for uh, and well, how, how that is decided. How do we decide if this message is appropriate for public comment? We don't, with um, public comments, we try to read and we've been fortunate in 99.9% .9 of the time that individuals have followed our, our request for respect. This chair appreciates what you just said, Ms. Morrison, and of course, as we go around, we'll come back and kind of figure that out. Uh, the language may well speak to the fact that uh, we do not embrace certain things, but uh, very well said. Dr. Carter. And that was a great segue into what I want to state is that I think if people want to come, there are two great options. They can leave a voice message and or they can come and address the board but the written statement to have another board member read them is, can be kind of awkward, especially um, given you're trying to make sure that you say or communicate exactly how they it have it written. It and sometimes it's um, not that I'm the best grammar person, but do you say it just like they have it or do you add some or straighten up the grammar or whatever? But then also going to the point of having it come in so late if you have five or six mm -hmm. things that need to be read that doesn't give the person time to read it so that's why i'm against number one but for two and three that's an opportunity you can leave a voice message you can say what you want that's written and as uh, mrs morrison has already stated we can re we receive all those emails anyway so if you want to leave a voice message and read what you have emailed that's great and or come in person but also just um, it is awkward I agree yeah it's really awkward and then the other thing is how many times do we extend it there has to be a limit on that and the other one is if we're looking at Mr. Harvey's the priorities I do think students yes but what will prevent a student from signing up on a community sign up sheet or the community from signing up on a student and then we it gets confused and then you have two or three students waiting and the community person has signed up. So what, what are the process? We're gonna to have to look at that too, to make sure if we do that, that we really have the time to look at that, to make sure that you know, we're keeping those things, those different groups um, separated. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, Attorney Towns, were you trying to comment on something or, or no? No, I was not. Thank you, thank you so much. Dr. Nellis. Um, I'm kind of trying to figure out what the problem is we're trying to trying to solve with, with this change. Um, I had two years as board chair, was never really an issue. Um, we've managed so far. Uh, formally, if the, if the will of the board is to allow specifically for emails to be read and voicemails to be played, then yeah, it would be prudent to uh, give priority to the speakers first and um, then in order voicemails and, and then reading emails. Um, and like others have said, we get the, we get the emails. Um, I would like to see some of the, uh, I don't know, a couple of the sentences need to be rephrased so that when you're there, does doesn't ref, only refers to plural, and that's just a personal nitpick of mine. Um, 
I, so I, I think we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't really exist, frankly. Um, and, in, and in regards to extending uh, the time, we can do that anytime. We just, somebody makes a motion to suspend the rules and off we go. Um, I think it's important to make it clear that we generally adhere to 30 minutes. And frankly, most of the time, that's been plenty of time. It's, it's an exception when, when it's not, and then we can make an exception to the rules. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nillis, and we'll obviously come back to that at some point. All right, uh, Dr. Gupta. I, I struggle with the same thing, which problem are we trying to solve? And as I think it, uh, one future problem could be uh, school boards are being politicized. So you may have people from Richmond, Washington, Charlottesville showing up who have no business with Lynchburg City Schools, have never been to a school system, and want to blurb about five minutes of their political garbage on us, which has no relevance to our students, faculty, and other stakeholders. So uh, that's the only, and as the environment becomes more hot in the coming years, in 2022, 2024, I see that poison will be spreading. So uh, Dr. I agree with Dr. Lewis. I was trying to figure out what are we trying to solve, and that's the only problem I could come up with. And I thought, okay, so. I'll shut up after that, so. All right, no, very, very important uh, insights to the table. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> a couple items I would, would bring up. Um, some of them are technical and then some of them are, are more procedural. Uh, first off, I would suggest under the receiving emails that those emails would go to a generic email address versus the specific address for the school board chair, because I could see the potential of, I mean, sorry, the school board clerk, I could see the potential that uh, the school board clerk might be away or on vacation or might even change in the future. Um, that would require you to change your policy each time the address of the, uh, or the email address would need to change. So. Having a universal email address could benefit um, all of us and it could be sent to all members of the school board as well as the superintendent um, so that we would receive those, those uh, comments. I would support also the priority b being given to in-person, people who speak in person because just like others have said, um, if someone sends something via email or a voice message, uh, we would all receive that. Um, and, and so that would also go to the phrasing. There's phrasing in there, will be read or will be heard. Um, I think there should be the stipulation as time allows, uh, because if we're going to give priority to people who have spoke, people who will speak in person, we could, in theory, run out of time, but our policy says will and therefore I think it needs to be tied back into the time allowance. Um, I do support the requirement that each person speaking should state either their address or their district that they're in if they do not wish to um, give their address publicly on, um, on TV, et cetera. Um, so they should either state a district or address or state that they are outside of the city limits. And that way, that helps us to understand is one of the points that Dr. Gupta made. I don't think we should discourage people from speaking from outside the district, but I do, I mean, outside of our city, but I do support priority begin, being given to those who have a uh, stakehold uh, in, our, in our school system. Um, I continue to support that priority be given to students and parents and staff then community, and then people outside of our community. Um, again, I, I agree with, with, uh, with Dr. Nillis that I don't know that we need to put anything specifically in here about extending the time because it's simply just to um, take a vote to forego the, the rules. Um, I would offer that the deadline, instead of being 3.30, should maybe be noon. That would allow plenty of time for um, our clerk and our staff to be able to 
prepare documents, possibly even go through them. Um, and I think that it might be good to have um, uh, guidelines for people who leave voicemail messages that they will be under the same three or five minute uh, limitation because as one of the instances that we had, we had someone who had left a nine minute um, voicemail and we were, we had to cut that short because we, those folks need to obey the same rules that are speakers in person. I uh, also believe that we as a school board, and this is a procedural thing, need to, as city council does, have a clock that lets the speaker know the time allowance. Uh, most of my comments deal more with procedural rules, so we make sure that it's clear to everyone that wants to come and speak, because the reason why I believe this needs to be looked at and reviewed is because there's a lot of hard feelings out there um, where people believe that the school board kind of picks and choose how we regulate our rules. And we need to make sure that we are, we have a standard policy that applies to everyone and there are no exceptions. So um, one of my colleagues one time, you know, corrected me that I, um, I flagged someone going beyond uh, the time limit but missed someone else. So I think if we have a, a clock up there that would help us all so those are those are my comments all right uh board i think that we have on our first go around heard everything that has been said uh in, in one instance we may be a little premature for action tonight i do want to remind us and i do want to thank mr harvey for his engagement in this matter but on march the third i did receive an email from him and it was also cc to the superintendent and the clerk and uh, we put it on our March the 15th uh, work session meeting and had some discussion about it at that time. And uh, subsequent to that point, the group met to look at it and here we are uh, tonight. Uh, I think the best we can do is gather what we've heard around the table and uh, Dr. Edwards uh, maybe bring this back uh, with the language of consideration of what we have. Now, the only thing is, in terms of direction for the superintendent, we've heard a lot. Now, I did hear Dr. Carter very strongly say she's against number one. Did I misquote you, Dr. Carter? No, you didn't. Okay, okay. With two and three. So, what are we talking, number one, two, and three? The uh, written statements. It's under the green section. Okay. Which is, okay. yes, right. sir. And, and, and maybe one of the reasons why we are doing this is because we embrace practices in COVID that we didn't necessarily have prior to COVID and they're not in this policy. So to update the policy, we need to include those practices if we wish to continue them or make the determination that we want to keep the policy as we have originally had that policy. At the same time, since there are other dynamics that have come up, Mr. Harvey has articulated some of them. Others around the room have articulated them. It gives us an opportunity to review the entire policy to make it relevant for where we are in these uh, weaponized uh, uh, season that we're in. Ms. Morrison. I think it would, I, I know we don't, may not always do this, but I'd like for the, to look at the regs at the same time because there are things in the, reg, in the regulations that specify, correct? Or am I wrong? looking to see if we have a reg for that. I but I know when you cross-reference cross KDZ, mm -hmm. there's a maximum number of six people. That's that's what I'm referring minutes. to is just and some other the things. 12 o'clock noon versus, so we need to look at those two policies together. <clears throat> and maybe it's the statement that, because I've read it so often as board chair and as we all did, that you read to the public before Maybe that's what I'm referring to before they, we start public comment. Did you read the disclaimer? Mm -hmm. All right, we, we got it. Uh, so um, I haven't said anything, but I'm, I'm okay with the three, personally speaking. I, I just think it has to be monitored. Uh, and I do thank Ms. Morrison in particular for mentioning my concern uh, I have two distinguished members of this board who previously served as chair and, and both did an excellent job 
uh, we did have a, a recent situation where um, during uh, family time there were some words that were stated that uh, probably were not appropriate for that moment even though it may have had some literary context. <clears throat> and I think the wording that we have, Dr. Edwards, does help us to appreciate the fact that there are not to be any profanity, vulgar language, or gestures already in the document. We just simply would need to enforce it. Uh, procedurally, I'm uh, looking at other school board meetings, they have some type of device where they can turn the mic off and those kind of things. I don't know if we have those capabilities here or not. Um, and the chair will say your time has expired and the mic just goes off and you move on and everybody seems to go along with that. Yes, Ms. Morrison. And in some, some instances there's a delay from li yeah. and during live broadcast so that if something slips that there's a delay so that it can be. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Dr. Brennan. Dr. I would just say as far as direction to looking at this again that I get the sense from the board that they're fine with not having a comment about um, a board vote to continue the, the discussion, so I'm fine with not having that piece. Okay. It sounds like there may be some support for having changing the time for cutoffs and things, and I would still support that at whatever time the, the, the board clerk and chair feel that's appropriate. So I, I will withdraw my suggestion about um, having a vote to continue discussion since the board seems to feel like they can just do that in the current. Through, through suspending the rules? Right. Yeah. All right. So is it other than Dr. Carter, is there anyone, and her point is, is a very very important point to, to look at, is there anyone that has any problem with green? Yes, sir. Well, I think I mentioned, you know, the, the email address, et cetera. I, and I, I, as I hear Dr. Uh, Dr. Carter, I kind of agree with her. Um, a written statement is basically an email sent to school board members. Um, I think at this point, if, if you really, uh, if you want to send something that the school board members get, an email is sufficient. If you're looking for the public to hear you, then you need to either leave a voice message that gets played so we hear it sort of straight from your voice. I understand exactly what the difficulty saying. that Dr. No, Carter has no, expressing no, no. the thoughts that might be in, in someone's writing. Um, so they can either do the voicemail or in person. But again, the, the written statement to me is just an email to school board members. Does anyone have an objection to us striking uh, number one? All right, so unless the board would speak otherwise, Dr. Uh, Edwards, could you all take this back and... Uh, I'm so sorry, go ahead, Dr. Gupta. So, I'm ADHD. Sure. Uh, you know, and when people write three pages long of email and you're reading it, I lose track of it. So please do give some consideration to people like me who like to hear you mm -hmm. and face to face, you know, that has more impact. And uh, so, but this is a First Amendment is a constitutionally protected right, you know, and city has set up an example when they did the Second Amendment hearing, it went beyond midnight to allow everybody against or for, like or dislike, to have their opinion, uh, you know, presented in front of the city council. So any topic which is emotional, I hope the school board will listen to people who show up on our doors. Which we want to do, correct? Yeah. yeah. All right. Until 1.30 in the right. morning. All right. let's, let's stay together. So then what we would do is we, we have a way by which we can communicate with each other uh, around getting some language. Uh, I, I've got my notes, and I'm sure that the clerk has and uh, Dr. Edwards uh, with the group, and we'll get something around so that um, this ought to be a fairly minor exercise on the 19th. Um, just adding that, get that taken care of, and we'll move on from there. Everybody okay? Everybody feel heard? Everybody shared what they needed to share? All right. Thank you so kindly. Thank you, Dr. Edwards, for your work on that regard. All right. We will now move to uh, K, uh, two simple items, if you will. <laughs> Number one, science textbook adoption. Okay. Back up to you. Um, <laughs> 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 Shall I continue? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So every seven years of June, the 
Department of Education revises the science standards, standards of learning. And this year's adoption that we're proposing are based on the 2018 science standards of learning. Textbook adoption committees, as well as all science teachers, administration, parents, community members, have had an opportunity to review these titles. And recommendations have been made to the curriculum and instructional department for adoption and purchase. Science textbooks adopted this school year uh, may be purchased for a seven year period, so that would be 22 23, all the way to 29 30. This textbook adoption is for six through 12 content only. Elementary will continue to use the science kits. And as you know, elementary science <coughs> kits are LCS created for K through 5 and are aligned. 2018 standards. After the materials were reviewed, the selected textbooks were recommended based on the correlation and alignment of the standards of learning, the quality of the content and supporting materials, and their appropriateness for students related to illustrations, diagrams, and readability. The selection reflects the integration, which is really important, of scientific and engineering practices to support the conceptual understanding of science topics. So six crit critical components for achieving science literacy are goals that support students' investigation of the natural world, that <coughs> help students understand that natural world, that address the nature of science, that support science and engineering practices, K-12 safety, and instructional technology. These six components support, support the profile of Virginia graduate, and an integrated approach that incorporates science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. The process started in the spring of 2021 by principals nominating teachers to be part of the core leadership group who was tasked to do the initial review. The online resources for the textbook list of VDOE approved science textbooks were available to those teachers to access during the summer. And in the fall of 21-22 school year, those same teachers reviewed the online and hard copies of the materials to narrow down the choices. A rubric was created with feedback from the core group and based on the video e recommendations. So science instruction must include processes, processes that help students explore the natural world, develop skills to be successful in college, science-related careers, and be workforce ready. We want our students to develop habits of mind like collaboration, curiosity, creativity, open-mindedness, rational thinking, objectivity, learning from mistakes, patience, persistence, and perseverance, making informed decisions regarding contemporary civic, <coughs> environmental, and economic issues, and understand the interrelationship between math, science, and technology. Now, following that review, those top choices were sent to the schools for all teachers and parents, parents to review, posted on the LCS website to notify the community that they were available, and available to the school board at the administration building. A survey was sent at the end of the review process to all science teachers and administration, and all feedback was considered. Those titles that ranked the highest made the list of proposed textbooks for your approval. For those contents that were not reviewed by the state, like Biology 2 and AP Environmental Science, we follow a similar procedure to identify the titles to bring before you for approval. Now, the, today the list is for information, next school board meeting for action. And I have included the list of proposed textbooks for your approval, as well as the cost of those titles for implementation in 22 23. Now, it is really important as you think about this and you consider this proposal that the last time that science textbooks were adopted in Lynchburg City Schools was in 2004. And the review was in the school year 2003, 2004. Thank you. What a report, man. This is you did an excellent job of presenting that report to us. So this is, is for discussion tonight and action at our uh, yes, next meeting. Any questions uh, for Ms. Yeager at this point? regarding that, uh, Dr. Carter. Do we want to add that to the consent agenda? We can always pull it, but it can be on the consent agenda for the May. Oh, uh, do we need it earlier then? Is this on the 19th or is this? This, is this would go on in May. This it is, is on the 19th. May, May. It, it, oh, it is on the 19th? Mm -hmm. It is on the 19th. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. 
Uh, is this a consent agenda item? Uh, can always be pulled. All right, let's let's put it on the consent agenda. All Thank right. you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Well done. All right, and that brings us to the next item, which is J uh, K two donation from the Virginia Education Foundation. Uh, yes, and I we have had a donation from them before, and this is a second donation, and I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Superintendent Pugh for a quick and brief update. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. So as you'll recall, last fall, um, the Virginia Education Foundation did donate um, almost 23,000 books to the university schools. Um, in December, the week before um, our winter break, the um, members of, some, of the curriculum instruction department had put together what they called Blizzard Books, and they delivered um, went to each elementary school and uh, students from each grade level were able to come out and select books that they chose um, that were at their reading level and also at their interest. And so we were excited to be able to, you know, put almost 23,000 books into the hands of our students in Lynch Varsity Schools. And these books went home with our students right before winter break. Uh, the Virginia Education Foundation uh, would like to uh, donate an additional 21,489 books to us. Um, the retail value of these books is about um, approximately $353,482. Um, the, the age level of these books has expanded. The fall donation was K-6, some seven and eight books, um, but there are books in here that um, are K-12. Um, so as you recall, last fall, the organization does ask the divisions who are accepting um, these donations to assist with the cost of their processing and shipping at $1 a book. Um, so we are excited to be able to do this. I've worked with the Cook and Instruction Department. They would like to do a second Blizzard of Books this coming December. Uh, we also have an opportunity to partner with a One Community, One Voice on a kindergarten reading readiness program. We will be able to pull the books that are at the kindergarten reading level from this donation to use with that reading readiness um, incentive program. Um, as you um, noted, may have noted, there is a list of titles. Um, I put those in your docs last week so that you could review them. It's also available for the community. Um, so you can see ahead of time uh, the list of books that they are donating for us or asking to donate um, this spring. Um, I, along with CNI staff, uh, preliminarily reviewed these books, these titles for content and age appropriateness. But as we did in the fall, um, if we do accept these books, we certainly would, um, these books would be vetted and read by CNI and school and instructional staff prior to the distribution um, of the books to our students. So I, this is a, again for information tonight. I'm coming back, I'm bringing it back in at 19th for your approval. Uh, I believe it is another great opportunity for us to support literacy uh, and also provide students with an opportunity to build their home libraries. All right, well, an yeah. another opportunity. Any questions from the board? And likewise, uh, Ms. Morrison. So the total cost for the school division would be? Zero. The total cost for the school division would be approximately $22,632, which last fall we used CARES funding, and I believe we can do that again this year. Cool. That's a dollar a book, which in a retail setting is, is pretty mm -hmm. um, inexpensive. All right. Uh, Dr. Carter recommended the consent agenda for the uh, K-1. Are we in order for that for K-2, Dr. Brennan? Yeah, I am, I am totally in favor of this project, as we've done before. I think it's great to have school books available for the children. I think that for the public to have time to look at this and get feedback is important on this issue, so I would suggest that this come back to us in action. I know that we can discuss. Yeah. Thank you so kindly. So K-2 will not be on the consent agenda as such, even as K-1 on the consent agenda still has to be approved, but could be pulled for further discussion as well. All right, any further questions on that? Thank you so much. We will now move to section L, uh, superintendent's comments. Absolutely. And I will be brief since I said a lot under LCS updates. Um, some of my comments, uh, the student, uh, Eugen actually uh, pointed out when she celebrated our HHS biology teachers being 
recipient, Catherine Drumheller. We are so proud of her. Um, we also saw a celebration for Ms. Wilkinson, the CTE CNA nursing instructor, but what she didn't say was that we had the students take the first part of their certification test and they had a 100% pass rate on the written part of that test. Um, absolutely. Which is absolutely amazing. So we celebrate Ms. Wilkinson and the students um, for their amazing work there. And just a couple little shout outs to my RS Payne Dragon winners in the Beatburg Poetry Competition. Um, we have a couple students, Allison Hansen for Life is a Game, Farhan Khan, The Countryside, I think it's Keanu Kelly for Self, Lillian Bryant for Sage's Requiem, and Seamus Barber for the Renard's Light. Um, these students did some outstanding work. We love to encourage poetry at the elementary level. So kudos to my little dragons for that. And then my last congratulations here is for five EC Glass Choral students who sang with the City Choir of Washington and an award-winning conductor, Robert Schaefer, Morgan Cook, Michaela Harvey, Claire Snyder, Maddie Dory, and Lucy White learned a masterpiece choral work and performed the music in Washington, D.C. with the City Choir of Washington and a professional orchestra. So our students are really doing it. Congratulations to the EC Glass students. All right, thank you, Dr. Edwards, for that. And you do an incredible amount of work, and, and that uh, is just a portion of the reflection of your investment. All right, with that having been said, we'll now move to uh, board comments, and we'll start with uh, School Board Member Harvey. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to, to encourage our public to support our two theater programs. Uh, EC Glass has the Mary Poppins. Um, uh, presentation and Heritage has the Sherlock Holmes presentation. And I believe both of them have uh, show times this Friday and this Saturday. this weekend. So I encourage the the public to come out and support our students. And I will be one to say these are incredible productions. I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not like an elementary school play. These are these are theatrical presentations. Uh, by young professionals, so it's it's definitely worth um, uh, the ticket price, which also helps to support our school theater programs. Um, I'd also like to say, uh, and I believe I've, I've sensed the 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 uh, will of the board on this that we continue to support the eight percent for our staff. Um, Absolutely. In talking with members of city council, members of our community, et cetera. Um, that we continue to um, make that a priority for ourselves and for council in consideration of the budget. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Dr. Gupta. So I wanted to thank Ms. Scott. She's sitting up there. You did a wonderful job in that career fair. I saw mm -hmm. a new energy in your staff and you and your team. And I know you, you're putting the best and the brightest, the new people you have hired. So uh, thank you very much for taking that initiative and moving it forward. And uh, Dr. Edwards, uh, you know, I, I have a new name for you. I, I don't know if you remember Margaret Thatcher. You used to call her the Iron Lady of England. And I think you're slowly, in my book, is becoming the Iron Lady of Lynchburg Street Schools. Uh, people every day are punching, but you stood your ground and you are moving this division forward and third. Uh, stackers, I don't know if you uh, have heard of them. They come up with the top 25 high schools in Virginia. And the latest list just came out, and they're five from Fairfax County, mm -hmm. and there's no school west of Richmond. Mm -hmm. So the challenge for us as the Lynchburg City Schools is that next year we got to get on that ranking. Uh, there are two governor schools, one in Richmond and one in uh, Northern Virginia as part of that, and I'm going to say that in Gov School meeting tomorrow. Mm. that our gov school should be on the top list 25 list what is stopping us from becoming the top of the top in the commonwealth of virginia thank you thank you dr gupta mr harvey and dr gupta thank you very much dr nillis uh no comment thank you dr nillis dr carter just want to encourage every family member parent guardian um, neighbors neighbors to come out to the planning meetings for mm -hmm. the schools yes to make sure you try to 
uh, if you can arrange your schedules to attend and also to thank the Education Foundation for the fabulous, fabulous morning of wellness. I know that our the employees really appreciate that and it's just a wonderful thing to happen. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Ms. Morrison. I too uh, want to encourage the community to come out to support the theater programs at both schools. On Saturday night at uh, Mary Poppins, they actually had three interpreters dressed in costume up on the stage and they had um, people with hearing impairments from four states who attended that performance and that's a great accomplishment. Um, it was something to see 40 students tap dancing <laughs> they were great so I encourage you to do that. I too want to thank Dr. Edwards and the entire staff for getting us to the point we are in with the school and the pandemic and the achievement that and moving forward and we can't thank you enough for that and your leadership thank you thank you Ms. Morris and Dr. Brennan I just uh, like to take a few minutes to in follow-up to our conversation about public comments and how important they are to us that I'd like to make a few comments about the presentation that was done this evening from the Lynchburg Area Food Council we've all received information from them um, I'm sure We've all read it and looked at the video, but I think there's a lot of in good information that they pointed out. Um, um, in addition, I did my own private consulting with my niece, who's a senior at Glass, who also pointed out that really the time for, for lunch has gotten, for some reason, shortened for unclear reasons. And I think that, pers that has, this initiative came before that actually happened. So I'd ask the board if, uh, if we could add this topic to a future agenda meeting, either the work session or the next session, so that we can find out exactly what the status is for meals in our schools now and what we can do to try to accomplish having more time for students since we know that the benefit of those is significant. So I hope that, I think I might need support from the board to have that add to the agenda, but if I can get support from the board, I'd appreciate that. Dr. Brennan, you have some other things, so let's stop at that for just a minute. Okay. Ms. Morrison would like to say? Uh, to Dr. Brennan, thank you for bringing that up. Um, as I spent 23 of my 28 years with Lynchburg City Schools in cafeterias daily with students. Uh, to me, this is a real priority. There's so much value in having the time to eat properly. They're so excited to see each other and to engage socially, and it's, it's really hard to watch the amount of food that gets thrown away because they just don't have time. And I think there are too many benefits for us to ignore, so I would Agree Thank wholeheartedly. You. Thank you. Uh, All right, Dr. Brennan will still have the floor. So unless there's a board member that would object, now it's a lot that goes into this the type schedule. of consideration, a whole lot, and has a lot of time-sensitive implications mm -hmm. that will have to be considered. So Dr. Edwards, oh my goodness, we're just adding things to the plate. But if the administration could look into this and you're aware of all of the dynamics that would need to happen in order for whatever would take place. So if that could come back to us in our May meeting, um, and uh, because I know it's very time sensitive. Uh, Dr. Gupta? Uh, that's fine, because I was not going to be here <coughs> here on April 19th, so that's what I was saying. Yeah, we yeah, have it. The May meeting. Okay. okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Brennan. Yes, you may proceed. So just briefly, I would also take on that the group suggested trying to do something for next year, which I think is also very reasonable. So I think we're not asking for a, a quick fix, but also to, for the information for hopefully to be in place for next year. Then briefly, I wanted to once again thank the staff for their tireless effort to educate and support our students. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the student rep pointed out that one of our students, uh, one of our teachers was recognized as a outstanding teacher by Lynchburg Magazine. We actually had five other teachers, Lucinda Pickerting from Bedford Hills, Becky Plansica of the Empowerment Academy, Stephanie Radar of Sheffield Elementary, and Alicia Wilkinson of Heritage High School were also in that group. So I would certainly like to extend my thanks and the board's thanks for that. Um, I'd also like to thank all the people who came to public comments at city council meeting last week mm -hmm. or two weeks ago to, to support the budget for Lynchburg City Schools. I thought it was an outstanding group. I think it clearly made, got the message from the community, from our staff, that this is important. So I want to thank them for coming. And then lastly, I just want to also make a comment about the production. Um, I have not had a chance to see the one at Heritage, but I did get the chance to see Mary Poppins with my grandchildren on Sunday, and it was really outstanding. 80 students involved in either acting or tech or stage design, and it was really phenomenal. So um, particularly if you have young children around to mm -hmm. take it to, it's really great. So I uh, thank, thank the EC Glass Theater for their production and their work, and I'm sure the same for Heritage. 
Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Mr. Tross. I, too, want to thank uh, the LCS staff and the teachers specifically for all the hard work they did to get us through this pandemic. Um, certainly, we are appreciative of their efforts, and I'm thankful that uh, we're given some opportunities to show that appreciation. Um, I, too, want to congratulate the students and uh, Ms. Wilkinson on their CNA exam. That's very impressive, 100% pass rate. I thought I saw that. I was uh, very impressed. And finally, agree with my other colleagues. Please, 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 uh, um, community planning sessions are so important. We want to hear from you and have your input on these very important decisions because we want to work and do the best for our students and our public and our stakeholders. So please attend those meetings and give us your input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trost. Well and so I echo everything that everybody has said and am enjoying getting around, and that would be all I need to say. Thank you all, board members. Uh, as far as the informational piece is concerned, section N, uh, spring break is going to be the 11th through the 15th, and we hope everybody <laughs> will be able to be as refreshed as you can during that experience, and uh, we wish our entire team well during that time period. Uh, of course, that councils are legislative advocacy meeting. Our work session will be on April the 19th, and you uh, can uh, go and look at that on Board Docs now, and you have the opportunity to look at whatever is on Board Docs already, as our clerk does an excellent job of putting things there, and you don't have to wait. You can go look at it right on up through that Thursday night uh, before it's featured on Friday so that persons can be able to interact with us regarding any concerns you have for agenda or what we're doing. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, finance is going to be on April 26th, as Dr. Miller stated earlier. Uh, with this in mind, we will now go to Section uh, O, uh, where we have a notice of closed meeting and pursuant to the Code of Virginia, Section 2.2, dash 3711A1, the school board needs to convene a closed meeting for the purpose of discussing the following specific matter, the superintendent's evaluation. Is there a motion to go into closed meeting? All right, it's been moved by Dr. Carter, seconded by Dr. Brennan. Any further questions or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. School board member, Mr. Trost. Yes. School Board Member Dr. Brennan? Yes. School Board Member Ms. Morrison? Yes. School Board Member Dr. Carter? Yes. School Board Member Dr. Coleman? Yes. School Board Member Dr. Nellis? Yes. School Board Member Dr. Gupta? Yes. School Board Member Mr. Harvey? Yes. Motion carries 8 to 0. All right. Well, we'll take a, a minute or two break. If you want to get your lunch, I mean lunch, <laughs> dinner, or whatever Breakfast. it is. Breakfast. <laughs> You can do that, and we're going to stay right in this room, and the clerk is going to pass out something to each of us so that we can have for the meeting. Um, I did talk with our school board attorney uh, in relationship to, uh, I have asked, unless there's some uh, objection by any of the board members, for Dr. Edwards to make a very brief statement at the beginning, and then she can go home and enjoy her family and the rest of the day around uh, a matter that, uh, am I still on? Yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> Maybe you go to a different room. Let's go to a different room. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. <laughs> Here you are. Yeah, we haven't gone.